Welcome, ladies and mental gents, to this narration of a book called The Introduction to Human Biology, taken from Reddit. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Nasona rushed along the narrow corridors of the space station, her talons trying to find purchase on the metallic floor to speed her up. It was futile, however, as they merely slid off the superior alloy. She knew she'd be late for class, again. Decidedly, she needed to work more on her sleeping pattern, but her findings had kept her awake all night. Entering the science lab, she quickly took her seat, hoping to not get noticed, but to no avail. Others would gladly kill her to have the chance she had to attend the prestigious Tarmina Academy, the only of its kind, an orbital station devoted to the training of elite students. Simply graduating from here meant opportunities came to you, not the other way around. Being late was completely unacceptable, and she mentally kicked herself for it. Stayed up late again, Lasona, shot out the teacher, Mrs. Moldron, an octopus type of alien species, and their science teacher. Lasona meekly nodded, trying not to cause a scene. Satisfied with the class attendance, Mrs. Moldron began her lecture. Well, I'll forgive you since you got some special material to cover today. Have any of you ever heard of a species called humans? The students conferred amongst each other, whispering back and forth, but found no answer. Mrs. Maldron was slightly disappointed, but the odds that they would know were very slim. Well, I suppose even geniuses can get stumped once in a while, she thought. She was about to spoil the details when Lysona was lifted up a paw. The teacher gestured to her direction with her tentacles, giving her permission to speak. Humans are a new species found in the corner of Sector C7-B. They are bipedal and are on path to soon discover FTL travel. She clasped her tentacles together, beaming with pride. Excellent! That is the gist of it, yes. I am surprised you know about them. Until yesterday, they were classified information. Well, the information may have been classified. Having a father who's an ambassador to the Federation can certainly help with that. Lysona spent a bit of time browsing her father's personal files while he was busy finding out about humans last night. The teacher continued on, drowning Lysona from a train of thought. In fact, today we will be learning about human biology and anatomy. It is a rather interesting topic in and of itself, but even more so because they are nothing like we have ever seen on pre-FTL species. This piqued the students' interest and curiosity. Notably, the militaristic ones who were always out looking for new foes and their weaknesses. Let us begin with the basics then. In order to properly talk about humans, since most of our information on them comes from records of their planetary wide available resource network, you will need to understand measurements as it pertains to them. It is much simpler to explain the length of human minute for a human centimeter than translate in every particular scenario. Reaching for her computer with her tentacles, Mrs. Maldron activated a program that displayed the information on the students' portable computers. Now that we have that established, humans are bipedal creatures, as Lysona explained. Furthermore, they can be categorized as mammals. They possess two appendages that they refer to as arms. These arms have a hand which enables them to complete complex motor tasks in lieu of other adaptations such as technology or telekinesis. For moving, they stand on two legs, which are balanced with feet. On every foot is five individual toes, a toe being a smaller limb that helps them with balance. One of the students raised a wing. You have a question? Yes. So they've only recently been discovered. Have we been looking into them for some time and only recently disclosed this information? I'm afraid that I'm not at liberty to disclose that, as this information is still under level 2 quarantine. Now back to their biology. The humans have an endoskeleton, its body resting on these bones. Human bones are primarily made of calcium, but other materials like collagens, phosphates, and trace amounts of other substances. These bones, depending on the density and their purpose, can withstand up to 8,000 kilos of weight before being crushed. Naturally, much less force is required to shatter one or cut through one. The teacher spotted another question. A student raising an antennae, questioning the, and granted the student permission to speak with a wave of her tentacles. Do they use these bones as weapons? Hmm. 
as a basic and crude weapon, yes. Humans can close their hands to form a blunt object and strike with it. This strength lies in throwing objects, however, using superior accuracy and speeds than most other species on their planet. They are able to achieve these speeds due to muscle elasticity and various other factors such as length of arms and the way their bodies can twist and rotate. One of the military students, a John, quickly asked a question. So they are predators? Yes and no. Hunting played an important part of their earlier years, but they also eat flora. They are an omnivore. They can forgo meat just like they can eat both. They are quite adaptable, to be honest. Back on topic, a human can lose a limb without suffering great loss to if it treated in a reasonable amount of time. The students express shock and outrage at the notion, many feeling their own appendages protectively, as if they were also at risk of being cut up. They can just grow them back. They do not grow back, no. However, human bodies are quite receptive to and have no reaction to many materials. As such, they often replace lost limbs with fake ones, made from wood, metals, or various other polymers. Such replacements usually reduce function of said limbs slightly. But in some cases, the prosthetics have shown to be an improvement upon the human's ability. To demonstrate, she called up the previous student who had asked the question, the R. Say to Malk, what happens if in an accident the pincer would break off? Um, well, slow and painful death as all liquid pulls out of my husk. Perhaps if a trained medical officer was nearby, say 200 heartbeats away, there could be a chance to patch it. Even after surviving, however, the integrity of my shell would still be compromised. I'd likely become a pariah, shunned by family and society. The teacher nodded, knowing what the answer was but wanting to let the other students also hear firsthand. In some cases, for organ-related damages, humans can also receive a donation from another human in order to replace said organ. I know what you'll ask, but no, they do not kill another one in order to harvest it. Some organs have redundancies, and humans can part with an extra one. Other times, the recently deceased human organs can be made available to transplant. Recently, in their history too, they have begun making synthetic organs with some varying degrees of success. So far, only the head, where the brain is located, cannot be saved in such ways. This, however, has not stopped them trying. Scoffs and various insults flew from the more religious species, condemning this as a barbaric axe only soulless savages would do. Please calm down. Now I have a video to show you. This is not for the faint of heart, however, and you may be excused if it proves too much for you to endure. The video began playing on every student's personal computer, showing a strange creature tied to a wooden apparatus. Other of the same creature surrounding it, many with rudimentary contraptions in their hands. Audio is heard. The creatures speak to one tied up and they seemed unsatisfied with the reply, using the tolls to strike at it. Scouring deep gashes into its body, a red liquid seeping out. One of the creatures approaches the bound one and uses a metal tool, tying it to one of the creature's small limbs. It speaks gibberish again and proceeds to pull hard on the metal object, tearing off the creature's limb, drawing great cries of distress and pain from it. Quite a few of the students turn off the displays in disgust, two of them exiting the room and looking pale. The video continues on for some odd minutes, the creatures becoming ever creative in the ways of inflicting pain on the other. At one point, electricity is fed into the creature, causing it to convulse as if possessed. One of the students vomits at this point, causing the teacher to pause the video. I believe that is enough, yes. It goes on for another 22 human minutes, culminating in the ingressors using a primitive kinetic weapon to throw a metal arrow into the head of the tied-up human. This is a picture of a said human ten years later. It survived the ordeal. One of the military students banged its claws on the desk in front of it. What? This is absurd! No creature could survive such torture! The video was verified as authentic. Another student, nearly in tears, spoke up. What did that pure thing do to deserve such punishment? The context of this video was that this was an interrogation of a prisoner and to extract information from it. C couldn't they have simply plugged it up to an MVC? 
The humans have not yet discovered how to build a memory visualization computer yet. Where did you really get this video and all of the information on their anatomy and biology? There's no way this was up on their communications network. Indeed. For better or worse, the humans have this fascination with preserving history. They collect even the most trivial things such as flags from the past walls and even rations from said walls. We were able to collect most of this information on our own in order to make sure that it was accurate, but when we contacted them, they also provided much the same information. They did not hide much. We've made contact with them then, and they volunteered this information willingly. Not even the yarn have told us how their biology works, and we've been allied for 400 years. There are two prevailing theories on why the humans shared this information so openly. The first goes that the humans love to share everything and want to learn the same about us. They assume that because they were open, we will be as well. The other is that it is a form of psychological warfare, making us scared of them. The student that had been agitated calmed down, sitting back down and talking to himself. How can we even kill them? One of his fellow military students tried to reassure him. Hey, maybe the humans could survive on a death world. Worst case, we throw them on one. Hearing that, the teacher chimed in. Wonderful observation. They are actually from the only known Category 5 death world. Isn't that fascinating? A student at the back raised a twig, asking a question. What are death worlds again? I figured some of you wouldn't know this. The non-death world species tend to gloss over it. They are environments in which there are active threats to primary sapient species of a planet. For example, the noir sitting in the back there with the sharp fangs comes from a Category 1 death world. There are large thunderstorms on his home planet that can be fatal. Mrs. Muldron drank a bit of water, clearing her throat. <clears throat> a Category 2 death world would have two types of threats to life for a primary advanced species of the planet. Threats can be classified in their own subcategories such as Flora, aggressive plants that may poison or purposely try to kill. Fauna, strong predators that can eat or kill, but also smaller creatures that may also have toxins or poisons. Diseases, such as viruses and dangerous bacteria. The environment, the storms on Noir's planet, dangerous temperatures and many other disasters. And finally, outside of the planet's environment, such as powerful radiation, common asteroids or meteorite striking of the planet. A Category 5 planet like Earth, which is what the humans named their home world, has all of these above threats. Perhaps we will even have to reclassify it as a Category 6 because of the immense biodiversity of Earth. It is hard to put an exact number on it, but there is something like 8 million different species on Earth when accounting for flora and fauna. Compared to some of our worlds, like Veltuna, which boasts 237 different species, it is a few orders of magnitude higher. The class sat silently, overwhelmed by the information it had been given. Now imagine growing up with a flora that can kill you, storms and icy conditions, or even the sun or asteroids can. On top of that, creatures that are neither your prey or predator, simply killing you out of indifference or because of fear. And not only surviving on this planet, but becoming the dominant species. This is what makes humans so interesting. You say, eight million species, but what kind of climate could accommodate all that? Great question. The various zones of Earth can vary from minus 70 degrees up to as high as 50s. Every biome contains its own specific species that live within the ranges of the climate there. This is due to their distance from their star and the warmth of it. Humans can live from minus 60 to plus 60, but prefer moderate temperatures ranging from 0 to 30. Lysona raised a claw to ask a question. What about population-wise? Currently, there are around 12 billion humans. Reproduction-wise, the female of the species will produce an offspring inside of her, carrying it until birth as mammals do. This process lasts 10 human months on average. The yarn sensed an opening for something that would affect a possible war. How many offspring and how often can they reproduce? Usually a singular offspring per bearing although two and three aren't unheard of, with more than four being edge cases. The female may begin a process anew as soon as the previous offspring is born. If the focus was population, they could likely double their current population in two years. 
They can have offspring after maturity, usually counted at 16 in human time. However, many wait later in life when the station is more determined, from the 20s to their 30s. The females have up until their late 40s, and the males are always fertile. Well, we're on the general topic. Humans can live up to 140 years, but most pass away due to other complications before that. Why are we even studying them if they aren't FDL and live very far away? I was hoping to tell you at the end of the week, but they now possess FDL drives, taken from some of the Federation ships. There was a small conflict due to a misunderstanding in which the humans seized three vessels. No loss of life occurred, and we have begun talks with them. She took a long pause, letting the students digest the news before she had to tell them the rest. Many were clearly in denial. Their reaction similar to learning that a creature from a horror movie was on the loose. In matters that concern us more directly, four human students will be joining the academy next week. Anyhow, we still have five classes before they are due to arrive, and we will learn more of them in time. This will be all for today. You are excused. If any of you have concerns, I suggest you contact your species diplomat aboard the station. The students exited the class, a mix of apprehension, outrage, and sadness exuded from their demeanor. Few seemed to be thrilled by the news, all save for one, Lissana. After everyone left, she approached Mrs. Muldron with some trepidation. I was wondering if I could have a copy of their network to help study them more before their arrival, of course. For science, well, it is being made public information, so I don't see the harm... I'm glad to see that you take an interest in this, Lysona. Most of your fellow students could learn something from you. Here, I'll do a direct transfer to your school email. Lysona thanked the teacher, hurrying to get out of the class. She went straight to her lodgings, fearing to be unable to control her body. She recalled last night how she found it interesting looking up the human so-called internet on her father's computer, from the classified files that pertain to their species. She had wandered aimlessly for a few minutes, looking for anything out of the ordinary. She even searched for her own species, but to no avail. Of course, they wouldn't know her species name, as she had then thought, what she would have to do to search by description. Scales, claws, talons, wings, and horn. The results had astounded her. The humans had a word for her kind. Dragon. She was amazed... No other species yet encountered that created art of her species without beating them. She only had a few minutes before her father came back, however, so she hurried in her browsing. It was then that she found the unthinkable. The humans had even drawn her kind as some kind of sexual fantasy. She was quite a take back. A few more searches and she realized something crucial by which she found on their internet. Humans would mate with almost anything. For a species like hers, where mating occurred once every century and more focus was spent on wealth accumulation, this was quite the finding. Her tongue danced excitedly inside her maw, hoping, hoping there'd be few males in the four students coming to the Tarmina Academy. Part 2 Jean Francois stood at the front of the hatch, two large round metal dolls that were completely sealed shut. He took in deep breaths, trying to calm himself. He knew the moment was coming. They'd been aboard the spaceship for five months in order to reach this destination. He stared at a literal portal to another world. A few more moments and his life would change forever. Their lives would, he thought, as he looked at his fellow three students. He'd been quite surprised when the school announced an impromptu test, and even more so by its contents. He must have scored well, because the very next day the faculty had called him to come in in person. He found it odd how there were a dozen black SUVs in the school parking, but ruled it out for some kind of coincidence. His heart sank, however, when he entered the principal's office, and six imposing figures were also present, all carrying weapons at their waist and looking very serious. Oh God, what did I do? He told himself. The principal, a woman in her forties and always dressed in a formal way, got up to greet him. Merci d'être venu, Jean-François. 
One of the men in clad in black coughed slightly, drawing the principal's attention. Ah, yes. You're understand English, of course. I need to accommodate our guests. Yes, of course, replied Jean Francois. They might be in France, but English was at least understood, if not spoken, almost everywhere. Mandarin was a close second, being spoken by more people, but in less countries. Thank you for your comprehension. Now I understand that you have been accepted into Yale, yes. Congratulations. Jean-Francois blushed slightly and tried to wave it off. I have some good and bad news, however. After the results from the new test we administered, an esteemed institution greatly wishes for you to attend. Jean-Francois blinked in disbelief. An esteemed institution? Could it mean? Yes, it could designate only one university. I am honored that they would select me, especially after an odd test like that, but I have already booked a room and bought tickets for September for Yale. This time, it was one of the Secret Service lookalites that spoke. I'm afraid it isn't optional. We're accompanying you to retrieve some of your belongings, two suitcases maximum, and then we'll escort you to get briefed. His mind spun, trying to understand the situation he was in. Before he could formulate a coherent thought, the two men helped him out of his seat and exited with him. The principal yelled at him before he was whisked away. Bon chance, Jean-Francois. The rest had happened so fast. Alongside three other students his age, they were told about alien life, both contact and placed on board a spaceship heading for an unknown planet. It was a great honor, they said. The pioneers, the first humans to go live and learn with aliens. He was flattered in a way, but he knew that the reason some president's daughter wasn't heading out was because... This was an unknown. They were in essence guinea pigs. He tried to console himself. He was no longer going to Yale, but the Star Mina Academy. He'd been told it was the most prestigious galactic academy. Think of the Space Harvard, he told himself. Crap, that didn't actually help. The trip itself had been rather uneventful, and they'd been plenty busy to not notice the time go by. The crew were a race of felines. The Federation had thought their appearance would help soothe the students since they were in some way similar to Earth species. The tiger. However, the Noir could use the whiskers in lieu of hands. Nothing quite like spending five months with large predators in a small cramped space to help with morale, Jean-Francois told himself as he struggled to sleep during the first week on board. The moment that they'd all been waiting for finally happened. The two doors letting out a large hiss as they decompressed and rotated to the sides, letting the spaceship crew and four humans dock at Tar Mina Academy. They learned how to roughly communicate with the Enwa using gestures, and the captain beckoned them to follow. Although they could stand upright, the Enwa generally preferred to stay on four legs, which had meant low headroom aboard the spaceship. But to the students' delight, the space station had some 15 feet of clearance. Jean-Francois had thought that it would be for practical engineering reasons, but also considered there could be 12-foot tall alien species, and he hoped his first guess was the reason. Passing along the inhabitants and the crew of the academy, the humans couldn't help but gawk, staring rather impolitely at the varied alien species. One creature looked like someone had crafted a cockroach onto a horse, replacing its head. Shivers flew down his spine, but he tried to keep an open mind. He was a representative of humanity, after all, and would try his best to leave a good impression. The Inwa captain led them to a moderate-sized room where half a dozen aliens of other species waited for them. The captain talked to the others in a language that they couldn't understand before taking his leave, saluting the students on his way out. A tall, lanky alien stepped forward, opening his arms wide. With its green and blue hues, it looked like some deep-sea creature. It looked at a small electronic device it held in its hands, small and only possessing three digits compared to a human hand, before speaking, Well, come! It frowned and resumed pleading, Primary, task, work, program, device, speech. It then repeated something similar, using the same flow but in a dialect that seemed Asian in origin. Finally, it reached out, tending small four devices to the humans standing in front of them. Jean-Francois looked at his fellow students who also were looking at each other for clarification. What do you think, Barry? Jean-Francois was glad in the way that Barry, an American, was here. 
he could at least communicate with him. On the other side of them, Laura and Izumi, a German and a Japanese students, were also talking amongst each other in Mandarin. Man, fuck did I know, Maz Barry's response as he scratched his head, but he added more. They probably want us to do something so that we can communicate. Jean Francois thought the same, but was wondering how to ask for more information. The alien seemed to struggle with human speech. He stepped up, picking up one of the small objects from the alien's hand and asked the question, How? The alien seemed to search for the right words, a few minutes passing by as the students held and looked at the devices in their hands. Teach device speech. Izumi seemed to catch on, explaining to Lara that which she had learnt. Jean-Francois looked at her, indirectly asking her to share her findings. She took out a small tablet from her bag and utilized the translation app showing Barry and Jean-Francois when she was done. It read, You need to program the device to understand your language. The device knows their languages. Now we need to tell it our words for their words. Wait. We have to teach the device, and I thought that we were coming here to learn. End of chapter. Chapter 3 Sitting at his desk, relatively appropriate to his eyes, Jean-Francois worked on programming the translator with the help of his laptop. The hardest thing to find on board the station during the last 36 hours had been human-sized furniture and accessories. Aside from that small fading, he had been almost impressed by how quickly things got done around here. They'd each brought a personal computer or tablet with them which allowed the station crew to adapt the technology of the translator to be able to interface with it, allowing for faster programming. Once that was done, Use of image and video could be made available, only then needing the user to input words or phrases to describe certain actions or objects. It seemed there was already some kind of library of information, gestures, concepts, and actions that merely needed defining. Like a complex book for children, where pictures corresponded to a word at the bottom. It started off simple enough, showing examples of one object in various settings and increasing numbers in order to establish a number system. Manually, inputting numbers up to a thousand was long and boring, but necessary. Jean-Francois wasn't even sure that a thousand would be enough. He'd have to add more to it later. Where it stopped, though? Billions? Billions? An idea that came to him, he'd focus on words first and then be able to speak for help himself in devising a faster and better way of doing it. Obviously, there would be some words lost in translation, or ideas that would be unknown, but the translator would work well enough to communicate. Updates and more words could always be added later. Jean-Francois was almost done putting the finishing touches on his translator when someone sounded the interrupter button at his door. He stretched as he got up, the joints of his body creaking softly as a low gravity. Staying haunched over as he programmed it was starting to get monotone and he welcomed the distraction. With his translator at the ready, Jean-Francois equipped it to his right ear and then went to open the door. Laying his hand on the nearby panel, which detected his DNA and allowed for locking and unlocking. Jean-Francois looked out the door, seeing no one or nothing, and was about to shut it closed when something moved the periphery of his vision. All the way down, a small round ball of fur was doing circles. He knelt down in order to get closer to the same level it is. Um, hello there, uh, what brings you here? The creature spoke rapidly in some high-pitched squeaks. Jean-Francois waited for the translator to start, but it seemed to not be starting. A few moments before giving up on it, however, the creature stopped talking and the translator began. Good, your translator works. When you have time, room 23C, deck 2. Goodbye. The small creature proceeded to roll away, leaving Jean-Francois alone. Ah, uh, it only begins translating after the user stops speaking. Good to know. I need to add more words, but it's nice to know that it's working. Seems like it goes both ways. The uh, more vocabulary I add to it, the greater translation I receive, and the more sophisticated mine seems to become. Deciding that it would be best to fill up the translator a bit more before meeting other species, Jean Francois resigned himself to work on it a bit more. He concentrated on expanding the vocabulary. That way, even if the sentences weren't lined up perfectly, he could still make things out. A grueling 30 minutes later of trying to think of words to add that weren't redundant, 
Jean-Francois decided to go and check how Barry was doing on his end. Their rooms weren't very far, simply across the corridor and around the corner. Jean-Francois sounded the bell like mechanism, alerting Barry to his presence. It did not take long as Barry opened the door and greeted Jean-Francois with his traditional greeting. Hey man, what's up? Jean-Francois slightly cringed on the inside. He had hoped that Barry would be more professional. Although on second thought, did aliens really understand human culture and would know what is proper and isn't? Not much. I've just come to see how you're doing. Any progress on your translator? Jean-Francois stepped into Barry's room as his colleague retreated inside of it after saying hi. Fetching his own translator, Barry put it on as well. Hey, I've got an idea. You probably programmed yours in French, right? I did mine in English. Maybe we can test it out with each other. They took our turn saying small, simple sentences, making sure that the translator did its job well and filling in the blanks when it came up empty on a certain word. Seeing time fly by, Jean-Francois remembered he had to go to a meeting. Hey, Barry, uh, I was told to go somewhere for a meeting. Wanna come? Barry thought about it for a second and nodded. Yeah, sure, man. If Jean-Francois had to use a word to describe Barry and only a single word, it would probably be chill. He had no idea how he'd actually made it through the selection, as he was one of the most laid-back, go-with-the-flow person he'd ever met. Jean-Francois and Barry walked down the corridors, looking for a deck 2 and a room 23C. It proved a difficult task, however, as none of the markings used the human alphabet at all. Scratching his head, Jean-Francois looked around for any possible help. He spotted an alien crew member doing some maintenance work on a small panel. He walked up to him, hoping that he didn't bother him too much. Hello, um, I was wondering if you could help me find a room. The translator did its job, connecting to the other nearby translators in range and expressing the sentence, those words, into something the other could understand. The maintenance worker, a slightly smaller creature, close to a meter tall with three legs, replied to his request. Which room you used? Deck 2, room 23C. Take moving stair three corners from existence, then move south 30 spans to height starboard. Okay, thank you. I think I can decipher that. So, take some kind of elevator. Then move, uh, 180 feet towards the side the station is steered on. Oh boy. It took a little bit of time, but the duo soon found the room that they were meant to go to. Thankfully, the door was already opened as they got there. Jean Francois hesitated on entering unannounced, but Barry stepped right in, entering and calling out, Hello, is anybody there? The room was dimly lit, the shapes being hard to discern. A voice called out to them and stood up from where it was seated. Hello, pleased that you can make translators work basic. Good, have sit. The light slowly became brighter, revealing more and the room. It looked to be some kind of office. Work office, to be more precise. Upon closer inspection, it was the same tall, lanky alien that they had seen the day before. At least, that's what it seemed like to Jean-Francois. It could very well have been another. He'd only seen the one and wasn't sure that he could discern them if he saw another. A few different sizes and types of chairs were present in the room, likely to accommodate different species. Barry noticed something similar to a bean bag and hurriedly jumped onto it. Dibs! Jean-Francois spotted something resembling a stool, but with a back, and settled on that. When the alien returned to its position behind its apparent desk, a ring rose up and covered half of its body, filling it with water afterwards. Past first test, translator work, presently in orientation, must evaluate human, make sure safe, no harm. Soon, join students in learning, time needed, perform test on human sample, make sure safe from other species. Jean-Francois noticed the translator seemed to slowly improve the more it worked. It likely held some form of AI or adaptive programming that allowed it to learn on the go. Other human also passed test. For you human minutes before you, first time sample species all finish work so quick. Human good potential, already spent time at Academy, back on world. Thank you for the compliment. Uh, your crew certainly helped with getting us set up for the work and our computers. That helped immensely. Um... Are you asking if we have schools back home? There's a few levels of schooling, yes, sir. We were about to enter college or university before coming here. 
The alien's colors changed from green to blue to a more subtle teal and yellow combination. Its demeanor seemed happy. Ooh, new word, college, university, mm -hmm, delicious. It designates specific learning, advanced learning, yes, good description. Most other species only teach the, 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 the special few. Uh, resources not wasted. Human different, different good, different better. For my species, speech is pleasure. Vibrations help us. Most of us work with translating and being diplomats. Barry and Jean Francois sat, mesmerized by the dialogue. It finally felt like a real worse contact, like they were having a real conversation with aliens and learning more about them. Enough for now, may go to rooms. One human period of sleep from now. If all test results good, join Academy students in learning. Don't worry, translator takes time. This progress good, quick. Some species take many cycles to this point. Some species even fewer words. Some species or some more words. Training, plant species have 50 different words per plant. It is unnecessary. Depend on plant. Love with plant. Sorry, got carried away. Please, uh, deserve rest. Enjoy. The lights dimmed once more, indicating to Barry and Jean-Francois that the alien wanted time to itself. Jean-Francois breathed a sigh of relief. He'd been so stressed out about everything was working out all right. He departed ways and headed back to the rooms on their own. If what the alien was telling them was right, the next morning life was about to get very interesting again. Meanwhile, on the other side of the station, a certain Lissona lay in a bed of coins, a tradition dating back millennia, reading her copy of the human internet on her handheld device. She'd heard from her father that there had finally arrived about 36 hours ago. Her tail danced happily side to side as she heard the news. She hoped that they would pass the basic tests the academy administers without much hassle. Judging from what she could read of them, they should have a good grasp of the basics. One thing in particular, however, piqued her interest. She had managed to find some material on dragons, as they called her race on the internet there, but most of the information was inaccurate. There was, however, some information that was scarily very accurate. How would the humans know about dragons? This was essentially first contact for their species. Or was it? End of chapter. Chapter 4 The next morning, as far as mornings go on space stations, Lucerna barely made it to class on time. And she was not particularly excited to sit in Mr. Florcher's military strategy class. As luck would have it, however, the teacher was late himself. The classroom was a large and metallic room with plenty of seating apparatus of various types. And when Lasona entered, she noticed a different smell was present, as well as a different mood from the other students. Scanning the room, she saw that she was hoping for. Humans, even better than one of them was sitting in her seat, giving her an excuse to go talk to them. Within three strides, she was standing over the human seated in a custom-made seat. It was far too big for the human, and he resembled an infant sitting in an adult's chair. Towering over him with a near three meters, depending on if he counted horns or not, she looked at him with a smirk. All right, being in command of the situation, show him you're strong and independent, and he wouldn't have to worry about you if you were his mate. He pushed back a bit, naturally, maybe saying that he was there first. Then she'd reluctantly concede, letting him have it while making him feel like she owes her. That'll get him interested, she thought. You're in my spot, human. As if someone called for a fight, every alien in the class turned around to look at the confrontation. Dwayden was notoriously short-tempered, and many wondered how the human would react. The human looked up and seemed a bit confused, then scared, then hurriedly got out of her seat and began apologizing. The translator covering its odd sounds into words, Oh, I I'm terribly sorry I didn't know her. I hope it didn't cause any offense. Lissona blinked a few times, the wind taken out of her sails. She sat down, wondering what went wrong. Humans were notoriously minor, judging from what she'd read in their history. They committed atrocious acts even upon one another, and often reacted violently or with defiance to those that wronged them. As she mulled over these thoughts, she felt a physical contact on her left side and turned to look. It was another human, but this one seemed to have fire in his eyes. The other human tried to prevent him from speaking to Lucerna, but he did so anyway. 
Hey man, if you're like uh, this huge lizard thing, that was not cool. What came out sounded a bit different to Lysona than the other aliens. Friendly greeting, fellow male, calculating for your size and species, that action was reprehensible. This was what she'd wanted, what she had expected from the humans. Everyone in the situation at the academy is so meek towards her, hardly able to express a differing opinion. It was a reputation her kind had earned over the years that made crossing Dwey Dun usually a bad choice. She elected to ignore the insult that she was male and replied, But this is my seat. It was created especially for me. No other seating object in this room would be adequate for me. Realization slowly dawned on the human's face, and it put one of its hands on its chin, considering her words. Well, uh, that makes sense, I guess. Uh, sorry about that. It then went back into the other human, which proceeded to physically smack the braver one on the shoulder, then seated themselves on the floor, resting their bodies on the wall at the back of the class. She kept noticing their furtive glances every so often, trying not to get caught by her. Slightly disappointed, she turned her gaze to the front. The teacher finally arrived in class, exhausted and out of breath. A Wendler, Mr. Florge, stood out in a crowd due to a white carapace that covered his whole body, along with an array of six eyes that enabled his species to have 360 degrees of vision. The teacher looked around the class and finally found what he was looking for. There you are. We've been looking all over the place for you humans. It took a few more breaths, stabilizing its body from the short, intensive bursts of energy that it expended. How did you know to come here? We were supposed to come and fetch you. One of the smaller humans seated at the front next to another human spoke. We asked other students where class was being held and followed the directions here. Oh, you can already read Galactic Common. Excellent. Getting multiple species to agree on any one thing was quite an arduous task. But after half a century, they had managed to get some semblance of a universal symbol identification system by using a periodic table of elements. Under a microscope, all elements look the same, no matter the species. As such, this was the best way to recognize a symbol from one species to another. Every symbol of an element corresponded to a letter of a species alphabet or equivalent system. For example, hydrogen could mean letter first from the beginning of the list, such a system was needed in order to label electronics or locations. The Sofen scientists were working on a workaround to use the translator for such tasks as well. But it wasn't ready yet and would need an optical component to properly work. Well, no matter. It seems everything is in order. May we have your names, please? On the right side of the class, a human stood up. I am Azumi. Pleased to meet you. She bowed before sitting back down. The student next to her then stood up. My name is Laura. I am from Germany. I look forward to learning. In the back, the two humans leaning against the wall stood up together, then conferred amongst each other to see who was going first. Hey guys, I am name's Barry. I come from America. I hope that we get along good. And lastly, the final human smoke. Hello, I am Jean-Francois. I am happy to be here and I'll do my best to meet your expectations. Clapping his four hands together, something similar to a smile showed in his face. Allow me to officially welcome you to Tarmina Academy as students. I am in charge of the student military program, so feel free to ask me if you have any questions. The smallest human called Izumi lifted a hand. Is there a specific arrangement for seating? Oh, they didn't make seats for you, did they? Now get it fixed by tomorrow. They will be custom made according to your size. You may then place your seat where you wish in this room. The human nodded writing down a note on her electronic device. With a bit of extra work and some help, they now could connect to the ship's local communication system, allowing the teachers to send information to them. Now, let us jump into it, shall we? Today we are looking at potential wartime scenarios and what plans or actions could be used to achieve victory. Here is the scenario. A strategic mine is in enemy hands, and possessing the mine would be helped turn the tides, but the system is heavily defended. How do you proceed? Use your pads to write an answer. You have 13 minutes and 49 seconds. Then we'll present before the class. Using their electronic devices, the students got to work. However, the human students paused and looked at each other and then the teacher. Is uh, 
There are problem humans. The one named Laura spoke. Um, are there rules? You must follow the laws of physics, cannot use technology not yet invented, and are limited to what your species has access to. John Francois got in before Laura could muster a reply. No, uh, we mean more like uh, actions not allowed, crime, something that would be breach of some law. Confusion was apparent on the teacher's face, which in and of itself spoke volumes regarding the answer. This is war, there are no rules. Some rules get applied after the fighting is over, com most commonly by the victors. How can rules be imposed before the winner is decided? That's all we needed to know. Thank you. A few intensive minutes of writing followed, with some head scratching as well. This was rather uncommon for human learning, especially for their level of education this was meant to be. Still, they performed the task as instructed. All right, time's up, any volunteers? A yarn student got up, puffing his chest, standing before the class with his pad. He showed his work. Using superior yarn lasers, which can strike at three times the range of other lasers, I would snipe them until they were forced to retreat and then simply land troops taking over the mine. The teacher nodded, taking the student's plan into consideration. A straightforward and decisive approach, excellent. Any thoughts in the matter, class? Most seemed satisfied with the answer, only the human showing some signs of dissatisfaction with the answer. Unable to hold himself back, Jean-Francois lifted a hand. Ah, yes, um, Jean-Francois, your, your thoughts? The idea seems rather straightforward, but what would happen if the enemy also had such lasers, or other types of weapons with a similar range? The scenario seemed to imply that the enemy possessed more ships than us. The teacher signaled to Heb Thought the yarn, letting him answer, then more ships and lasers. Always has worked before. Why wouldn't it now? How about you show us how a human would do it? Jean Francois wasn't a fan of presentations, even less so in front of dozens of aliens. But when life gave you lemons, he moved to the front, taking position where Heb thought was and cleared his throat before commencing. Well, I have two ideas. The first one is cheaper, but it has more ways that it could go wrong. Using spies, I would infiltrate the enemy nation using them to covertly change the destination of the mine shipments, making them deliver it to me instead. The other plan, given that you mentioned the system is heavily defended, would be to tow in an asteroid and hurl it at the mine's location. It would mean that we do not get the advantage, but we also negate the enemies, having spent fewer resources. Mr. Florge seemed rather shocked by his ideas, but nonetheless... Applauded. That was a very interesting take on our scenario. The excellent even. How about Ashro? The Noir laying down in a small circular pillow at the back stretched, extending his front paws all the way. Ashro got up on all fours and headed to the front, taking Jean Francois's place. Using a smaller fleet, I would initiate contact with the enemy, making them chase us before striking with the rest of my fleet on their flank when they least expect it. The teacher thanked him for his idea and asked for a volunteer, finding one in Laura. Thank you. Using a smaller ship, I would slip past the enemy, detonating nuclear weapon five kilometers from the surface. Miners all die. When the enemy fleet go away, we mine the minerals using special equipment to protect against radiation. If the small ship can sneak by, use it as a suicide ship in a large fleet, Bomb doesn't do much in a vacuum, but radiation would fry most electronics. The teacher blinked a few times, making sure he heard correctly. A nuclear weapon, uh, what is that? Laura thought about how to explain it in a simple way. Hmm, it's splitting an atom. I'm only a layman. Uh, it would be hard to explain. It is done with an element that is near critical mass, sir, uh, if, if that helps. Uh, I see. I shall have to look into this. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Do we have another? Oh! Most of the other students had now put away their works, looking expectantly at the remaining two humans. Izumi found everyone in the room looking at her and blushed slightly before getting her composure back, getting up to do a presentation. Hello, um, if the enemy holds superior numbers and greater military might, then the solution is to target the population and economy, developing a virus that specifically attacks that species. I'd first deploy it at the mine's location. If they still persist in defending that system afterwards, I would then target the agricultural sectors, forcing them to spread their fleets or risk having riots occur on their homeworlds due to feud shortages. 
An intriguing concept. I think we should be a, a small pause. Everyone's free to go eat something, and we'll continue after 72 minutes. John Francois found it odd how specific the time specified was, but calculated that one human hour would likely be just an odd to them. His stomach growled, having eaten the last of his Earth rations more than eight hours ago. He was very excited, however, as the prospect of trying alien cuisine. As the students began leaving the class, the teacher signaled at the humans to wait a moment, using his palm as a way to stop them. A moment of your time, if I may. I just want to make sure you are indeed human students, correct? Not experts in your respective fields. Barry answered that question. Oh yeah, we're all going into a year in either college or university. Florage mulled over the words spit out by the translator. What do you intend by place of higher learning? Can you tell me more about human education? We start off in pre-kindergarten at like uh, four years old, moving up into primary school until sixth grade, then it's high school for another sixth until twelfth grade, when we then proceed to either college or university when we're at eighteen and adults. Then it can vary a lot depending on the degree. I see, uh, that is a lot of learning. You spend nearly one-fourth of your life studying then. That does explain some things. Most of the other species mature much faster than humans, reaching the equivalent of adulthood in four human years. They're usually taught the basics that they'll need and only ever learn advanced matters if their works require it. Laura stepped up and quickly without question. Are other species in general less educated than us? I would not say so, no. We tend to devote all of our efforts to the geniuses as they are more likely to provide results. In a way, these classes at the academy are more similar to your early high school years. If a student shows promise in a certain field, only then are they devoted the resources needed in order to train them. Otherwise, it would be a waste of time and credits. Finding students that possess the spark for our paramount goal, it is those students who propel us forward into the new inventions and innovations. Anyhow, thank you for enlightening me. Please, go eat. You'll find your provisions area on the deck, room 116. The humans excused themselves and walked together. Laura seemed to be the one taking this the worst. I can't believe it. They have such technology, and the students are this far behind. What are we even going to learn here? Razumi tried to console her. If, um, the difficulty of the material is lesser, that does not make it inferior. We have much we can learn. There are dozens of new cultures and their way of doing things, including unknown biology and likely elements as well. Laura grumbled as her assent, but still seemed sour. They'd reached the provisions room, as their teacher had mentioned, still seeing the small line of students waiting their turn. At least queuing was something that they had in common. They watched as students from different species left with trays filled with vegetables or fruits, some even having large slabs of raw meat on them. The line moved rather quickly, and they soon found themselves at the front, looking at an alien with six arms that looked awfully a lot like their teacher. Behind a counter, it stood next to many boxes and asked them what they wanted. Meat or vegetables? Jean-Francois was appalled at the offering. Ah, sir, you don't cook anything. The only available food is raw stuff. The provisioner seemed intrigued by this line of questioning, but also baffled by the human's words. If you want me to start a fire, look. Tell me what you want to eat. I'll go fetch it. Meat for predators is some sort of fruits and vegetables for the others. This was a drop that made a glass of water overflow. It was one thing to be stuck on a space station with an odd aliens, but not having cooked food. The French heritage and Jean Francois cried at the injustice and rallied in the humanity of it. The hell with decorum. If he couldn't have a cooked food, he would go crazy. Give me both, and I'll figure it out myself, he spat with more venom than intended. Omnivores were a rather rare breed, but the provisioner was aware of them and gave in to the human's request, if only to get rid of him. Jean-Francois's fellow students settled for vegetables and fruits while he went on a mission to find a source of heat and a metal container. End of chapter. Chapter 5 Jean-Francois made his way out of the provisions room, wondering where he could find the equipment to a stove on the space station. The provisioner was right in a way. Starting a fire on a station wouldn't likely be a bad idea, but John was too incensed at the time to realize. As he stalked the halls of the space station, he began talking aloud to himself. 
All right, so we're on the station, the aliens don't cook, and I can't start a fire either. I need something warm, maybe more hot than warm. What if, um, they have some kind of system powering everything in here? Does he use electricity? That'd be a reasonable assumption. We're in space, so we need something to heat her to keep us warm. I, I don't feel any warm air coming out of the vents, but there must be something that regulates the temperature. Two aliens doing maintenance on a panel turned as Jean Francois spoke and gave him the strangest look. He realized that he likely looked sunny around like this while talking to himself. But he was a man on a mission, so uh, damn the optics. Once out of earshot of the human, they whispered to each other, Oh, that? Never seen a species like that before. Must be one of the new ones they sent to the memo about a uh, human. They are peculiar. We, we should probably steer clear of their way. The other nodded, returning to his work. Jean-Francois continued looking for possible rooms and corridors for a location that could have what he needed. Soon, he came upon a sign outside of a door that he didn't recognize. It looked like some kind of reactor. Curious, he went inside. Multiple machines seemed to hum as they did their work. Tubes with glowing liquid went from the machines into the others, forming a complex array, all in precocious harmony. Higher up on the walls, large panels could be seen holding some computer-like systems that flashed with multitude of lights, all with alien text scrolling down the screens that appeared to be monitors. A few barriers were also present, surrounding some of the equipment, and Jean Francois noticed some visual cues that would indicate some kind of hazard, but could not decipher the symbols. A loud alien voice spoke out with some authority behind him. Hey! You can't be in here. Authorized personnel only. Jean Francois turned to the right and found a frustrated alien. It was slightly shorter than he was, perhaps 140 centimeters tall, and looked like a crossbreed between a jellyfish and a scorpion. A dozen or so tentacle like appendages dripped down from its head, which was where the stinger would have been, and seemed to behave as arms while the rest of its body was supported by a large base featuring six legs. Oh, Hey, um, what is this place? Who are in engineering, Station Cruoli? We've got things to do here. He figured he might as well ask the alien for some help. Hey, look, quick question. I need some kind of flat metal plate that can radiate heat. I need to cook my food. It looked at him with some mix of disgust and apprehension. Why would you possibly need that? We don't eat raw food, at least not consistently. Breaking it down by cooking it allows us to more efficiently process the nutrients. It also tastes like a hundred times better. The gears were turning in the alien's head, clearly seeing some potential to this idea. Interesting. You must be one of the new arrivals with spark potential. Yeah, um, we got you a little more than a day ago. Uh, what do you mean by spark potential? Y'all species must know the spark if you are found worthy enough to be bring here, no? It's a special gift that can arise from any of us. It lets us expand our horizons, create, invent. Well, uh, that's a long definition for intelligence, thought Jean-Francois. You mean, uh, intelligence? No, it's, um, different. Every person aboard the station can be considered intelligent, but not many of them could come up with a, a concept for the space station, for example, or uh, your cooking idea. Uh, so, like intelligence, but different. Imagining new concepts, so, um, a bit like creativity. The alien's word lit up with an expression of motions as it motioned of the word. Yes, the spark! I knew your species must have had a word for it. Very well, let me check to see if I can provide you with something for your project. Uh, don't touch anything. The alien left before Jean-Francois could continue the interesting conversation that he was drawn into. It seemed like creativity was something that was rare occurring only every so often in other species. It explained the lack of ideas and strategy that were displayed during the class that they took, and in some ways, the lack of conking. This whole academy, then, was merely a tool, or rather an experiment designed to scout those with creativity in order to hasten their progress. The thought crossed his mind to try and explain that creativity is something inherent in every human, but he wondered how it would be perceived by different species. Before he could spend more time on the subject, the alien returned with something for him. 
This is uh, what we use to eat up sections of the station. You see this little bar on the outside? Push it upwards to increase the heat and downwards to lower it. Usually we keep the station at 14 degrees Celsius, as it is the optimal temperature for most species. Not too hot for those who prefer colder climates, and those who prefer a warmed one can simply dress up a bit. Don't use this so much that you change the temperature elsewhere. Okay. We'll keep that in mind. It's only for a few minutes at a time. This is powered by a battery. Good guess, but no. Otherwise, everything would need batteries. Instead, we use inductive coupling to wirelessly transmit power to every device in the station. Wow. Amazing. Say, um, what do you do here? I'm the chief engineer. You may call me Scotty. No, I do really need you to go. Jean Francois thanked Scotty for his help and returned to his room to attempt cooking. At the other end of the station, Lucerna was looking forward to a good meal as she left Mr. Florger's class. The first encounter she had with these humans was interesting, but her hunger came first. Thankfully, her species received two servings worth twice a day. She picked up her meat, drawing a few sideways stares from the other students, some of envy from the other carnivals and others of disgust from the herbivores. As she was getting ready to go to her room, she saw the humans leave the class and go in a line. She decided to wait to see what they would choose. She read that they were omnivores, often seeing mention of meats like bacon and their internet, but they didn't exactly fit the profile of a species that ate meat. After all, they had no natural weapons to catch prey. She witnessed quite the outrage when they reached the front of the, one of the humans, raising his voice and acting rather hostile. To her surprise, it was the one who seemed so meek when she confronted him that initiated that disagreement. He ended up taking both offerings and the other three opted for vegetables and fruits. After getting their food, they split up, much to Lusona's confusion. The other three seemed as confused as her, looking around trying to find who knows what. This could be a good chance to approach them, get to know them a bit better. The humans were talking to each other as she began walking towards them. Spotting her out of the corner of their eyes, they turned to look at the increasingly large shade of red that was getting nearer. Barry was the first to speak up. Hey, is it me or that big red lizard approaching us? Nizumi weighed in on the observation and corrected him. Lizard, um, I'd say that it's more like a, uh, a dragon. Wow, a dragon. Lasoda was standing upright in full view of them, her red scales glistening under the station's ambient lights. Her scale varied slightly, going from crimson to lighter shades of red and spots. The scale stopped as they reached the front of her torso, a thick beige leathery material covering her exposed underbelly instead. On her head, a slightly larger horn than the two above her ears stood out between her two nostrils. Two wings were kept close behind her, their tips barely poking atop her shoulders. They seemed rather small to propel a creature the size of that into the air, however. Lastly, contrary to mythological dragons from Earth, her neck seemed to be of a more reasonable proportion. Hello, humans. Are you lost? Barry looked at her from top to bottom as she replied, taking in the eight feet of her, Oh, we're just wondering where the cafeteria is. Common place where people eat. You won't find that here. You traumatize the poor herbivores if you place them next to carnivores while they ate. Best to use your quarters for that. Is eating with others a human thing? Oh, um, okay, uh, sort of, I guess. I mean, uh, some people eat alone, but uh, many use lunch as a way to socialize or as a replacement for a meeting. Middle meal of cycle. Interesting. You even have specific words for every time you consume food. If you're going to eat somewhere together, mind if I join you? Simultaneously, all the three looked at each other with some skepticism, unsure of what to think about the idea. Barry started a bit, and Azumi decided for the group, Well, I suppose so. We should get to learn about our fellow students. Good, sounds good. Um, uh, let's go to, go to my room then, offered Barry. Laura and Azumi shot each other a look that said a thousand words. No, thanks. Uh, let's go to mine. They made their way, following Laura and drawing quite the few funny looks, seeing Lusona follow them. 
all now present in Laura's room, which she had kept immaculately clean. They began eating. A single large vegetable and what appeared to be a handful of fruit looked all right for consumption, and so they dug in, still wishing that it was cooked, but willing to give it a try. The single vegetable seemed rather dense, packing more weight than its size would normally suggest, with an appearance similar to that of a large orange potato. They took a small bite, checking for taste and consistency. You know, that kind of reminds me of a cucumber, said Barry. Maybe, um, uh, for texture, but the taste is more like acidic, like some kind of tomato, replied Laura. They carefully savoring the alien food was interrupted by a loud slurping and chewing noises, turning over to Lucerna, who had made short work of her meat. It was then that they understood what she had meant earlier by making her bavols uncomfortable. Trying to wash away the gory details from her mind, Izumi broke into ice with a question. So, would you say that your species are dragons? Questioned Azumi. Her tongue licks her mouth for all traces of meat that she just ate, making sure that she lost none of it flavorful droplets. Her forked tongue seems to mesmerize Barry, who stopped eating to simply observe her. Hmm. The word dragon does translate into a specific characteristics that it would describe one of us, but it is not our given name, no. We are called the Dwaydun. Izumi continued her line of questioning. How is it then that we have descriptions of your species from such a long time before we ever met you? Laura jumped in, also curious at the whole situation. Yeah, what about fire breathing and wealth holding, all the dragon myths? Well, uh, we can't breathe fire for one. We do tend to hold things. It's a byproduct of something in our brains that makes us want to stay sitting on something in order to prepare us for covering our eggs. The process takes many years, so it's hardwired into us. Before you ask, no, we can't really fly. At least, not in most worlds. The gravity and atmosphere just has to be right. I will admit, however, that I am exceedingly curious as to the coincidence of all of this. Nothing in my people's history describes humans, but it is too much of a chance that you just happened to invent Wayden. Yeah, I will try and investigate this when I can. I was actually hoping you knew of something that could help me a bit. The rest of the meal continued much the same way, sharing small bits of information about the academy in regular conversation. After a few minutes, Lissona's electronic device emitted a small noise. Oh, we should get ready for class. The break period is almost over. All three reached out for their own device, confirming the schedule and the class location. Oh... By the way, a few of us are heading over to the recreation facility afterwards. Would you want to join? Added Lasona, as she stood up at her head for the door. Is it some kind of sport? Inquired Laura. I guess you could say it's physical activity related, y- yes. All three looked at each other and smiled. It had been too long since they got to properly stretch. Hey, I wonder if John Francois had time to eat mentioned Barry offhandedly as they all walked for Laura's room. End of chapter Chapter 6 When the thermoplate in hand, Jean Francois rushed into his room, time being in short supply. The plate had done its duty, having gently cooked the meat that Jean Francois laid upon its flat surface. It was a situation far from ideal. He'd need to get a grill made when the chance would allow it but it had enabled him to eat his fill. Feeling completely satisfied and perhaps a little bloated from having to eat so fast, Jean-Francois entered the classroom with the intention of lying down against the wall, forgotten at his little corner. Much to his dismay, however, as soon as every student had entered the room and the class would resume, he got the distinct feeling that it wasn't going to go too well for him, as he could feel the glances shot his way by his fellow students. All right, I trust everyone has had time to get everything they needed to do accomplished. Good. Let's uh, resume with the presentations. Mr. Floyd scanned over the room, seeing a rather low excitement level amongst the students. Well, I suppose I should address this sooner or later. I'm sure that you may feel slightly inadequate right now, or perhaps not very confident in your own abilities. I have a little chat with our recent arrivals, and there are certain circumstances that explain their level of advancement. It would perhaps be best that they explained it so that you can hear it from the source. 
Mr. Florch ceded the floor to the humans, each getting up to the stand in front of the class. It reminded Jean-Francois too much of high school, where many of your projects had to be done under the gaze of every one of your peers. Well now, for most of you here, this is your first time you're in such a defined learning environment, isn't it? Mr. Florch said out loud to no one in particular. Nods of agreement from various aliens confirmed his hypothesis. He then changed his attention to the humans. Hmm, Barry, was it? How many cycles of schooling have you undergone? Barry thought for a bit and used his fingers to count. If we count the early years, um, like before first grade, uh, somewhere around uh, 14 now. If I had stayed on Earth, I'd be looking at graduating in another four years. Shock gasps from the class surprised the four humans. Amidst the outrage, some could be heard describing it as a life spent in a classroom. Others were calculating that it amounted to one-fourth of a human's life. You see, it's only natural that they have more experience with a learning structure like this one. Their education system does not give them an advantage here, but it would not be feasible for many species, like moi, who only have a life expectancy of 40-odd years. Now, I hope that Mrs. Muldron won't flame me alive for this, as it would fall under her purview. But history and culture are an important background for military teachings. Can you tell us a bit about humanity's past wars and how it has affected your culture? While the others seemed to hesitate, Laura launched into an explanation. In some ways, we've always had conflicts. We've begun to be more unified lately, but we're still very fragmented into many nations. You're divided into clans, spoke one of the students. Jean Francois cleared his throat before replying, Well, um, you could say it's similar to that. Areas are broken down into countries which have defined borders. Every country has its own set of laws, language, religion, and culture. Can you describe some of these uh, in regards to military subjects? asked Mr. Vlodge. I'm not sure where you want us to start either. There are many thousands of years to go over. Laura was having difficulty imagining a starting point for human war. Wherever you feel is appropriate, Mr. Florge's concise response. She decided to go at the very beginning and try and shorten it as much as she could. Having no natural weapons except for some teeth, we've been killing each other with sticks and stones for thousands of years, simply holding them at arm's length and swinging. Then we added stones to the ends of the sticks, killing from further away at a safe distance. After that, we thought, uh, why not throw the pointy sticks at our target? But then we found ourselves weaponless. So we made smaller sticks with sharp stones, but they weighed less, so that we had to throw them faster. So we had to add flexible material to curve the wood piece, making bows. That was the start for many thousands of years, and really helped with hunting. Ah, do you honestly expect me to believe that you could chase down a four-legged creature and kill it with a pointy stick? I could win a race twice by the time you're only halfway. The mocking came from a large alien student, four legged and covered with fur. Laura's eyes gleamed in a sadistic way, as if inviting the student to challenge her, gladly welcoming the chance to prove him wrong. Oh, yeah, I heard something about this before, Barry said. The animals we hunted ran fast, but uh, we could follow them at a jog. After we tracked them, they would run, but we kept on at it as they never had time to rest. Eventually, they sort of just collapsed and we killed them. I think it was uh, endurance hunting. Persistence hunting is the proper term, clarified Laura, slightly miffed that she lost the chance to personally explain it. The color drained from the alien's face, likely seeing how the scenario could unfold in his mind. Other techniques also used were traps, ambushes, and game jumps. Izumi's soft voice felt odd while listening to horrible things the humans did to their prey. Seeing everyone else speechless, Laura continued. Anyhow, when we figured out how to melt and forge metal, covering ourselves in suits so that arrows couldn't pierce, so we made metal swords that could go through the small cracks and maces that would cave in the metal helmets. Then we thought, what if we shot arrows even faster? so we used levers and bodies to build an even more tension. That worked really well. So what, in fact, that one of the religious figureheads said that it was too cruel and banned its use. No. Oh. And we also had building things out of stone during this time, but sometimes we had to destroy them because the enemy hid behind it, so we made large wooden arms to throw stones. 
We improved that design, but over the years, using counterweights and different types of stones until we figured out that you could use the powder. Light it on fire and with a controlled explosion and send the projectiles farther and harder. So, in a way, humanity has 10,000 years of training and optimizing how to throw things. One of our favorite pets has been trained to fetch what we throw and bring it back to us in order for us to throw it again. We're so good at throwing things that for some sports we force a handicap on ourselves and prevent the use of our hands. So, after cannons, it took some time, but we figured out how to do that on a smaller scale that every soldier could carry. Then someone found out how to have the weapons shoot multiple bullets in rapid succession. This changed the way we did warfare. In the middle of this, we started making chemical weapons, bombs, and rockets. What kind of predators are on your planet that you needed bombs and rockets? asked one of the students. Well, no. The, the weapons were for use against humans, sir. Although there was that one Ibu war. Barry was trying to remember the exact details, but failed. Why were you fighting each other so much? Why couldn't you just be more resource efficient and to cooperate? Many of the students also added their agreement behind this question. Uh, this one's a bit harder to explain. Human leaders have a long history of being corrupt, all the way back to our first kings. Another reason is location. Some areas have better living conditions or local resources. Add in a bit of religion, and you've got holy wars. By this point, everyone was so silent that they could hear a pin drop. A few seemed to have questions, but Mr. Florch decided to cut it short there. Well, that was quite insightful, thank you. That's all the time we have for now, however, so I'll let you all go. Next class, we'll have the fleet formation, ship designs, and roles. For those going to Steel Squadron, don't overdo it. The classroom cleared faster than the last day of school, and the humans found themselves mostly alone, barring two or three other students. Oh, hey, been meaning to ask you, uh, did you manage to cook? Barry seemed genuinely interested. Yeah, had to chow down really fast, but I'll be better prepared from now on. Tasted a bit like unseasoned pork. It's going to be a while before I can make a five-course meal, I think, but uh, the next thing on my list is getting hold of some seasonings and spices. Think about it, man. You're the first space chef. Jean-Francois mulled over the fact, and he was quite probably the first space chef. The sonar passed by the group and was leaving class. Ready to go? The others nodded in agreement, fetching their bags. Hey, um, where are you all going? Jean-Francois asked, snapping out of his daydream. Oh, uh, we got invited to recreational facilities. It's, if it's all right with Jean-Francois comes too, he asked the sonar. She thought about it briefly and seemed content. Why not? We'll be six if he comes, just enough to make two teams. The four followed Lucerna to a large elevator, where they all entered, looking over the console. She pressed the topmost button. The elevator whirled to life, and it began its ascent. The doors opened, revealing a large domed area, almost covered exclusively in windows or some see-through material. The dome was braced with another material, black and seemingly more rigid. From the windows, a flat surface extends for a few kilometers, the dome standing out in the middle of it. Inside the dome, a lounge area with many seats, patches of grass and trees adorn the room. To top it all off, a large swimming pool is contained in the middle. Wow, what is this place? This is the recreational facilities. Right now it is booked for carnivals for 158 minutes, switching to herbivores after that and repeating with one rotation and three closed for maintenance and cleanup. There's relaxation spots available for various preferences, swimming, and there's even a few other things to do up on the second level. The sonar motioned for them to follow her, and they headed off towards a large set of horizontal doors. She took out a small card from a bag, swiping it on the console next to the doors. With a whoosh, the doors opened and they proceeded inside. Now inside more of a hangar than a lounge area, Jean-Francois noticed the large metal objects held by multiple chains and surrounded by scaffolding. Wait, is that what I think it is? Definitely looks like a Mac to me, man! Barry rushed off at a sprint towards the large metal construction, quickly followed by Jean-Francois. Laura shook her head, disappointment plainly obvious at her fellow humans. Huh, boys in the toys, but uh, really, what is this, Lasona? This is one of the four stables for Steel Squadron here on Tarmina. This wing is sponsored by the Dewey Dunn. 
Would you like to play a little skirmish? End of story. It didn't take much coaxing to get the humans to agree. Even Izumi could hardly contain her excitement to get inside the equivalent of a Gundam. The hardest part was getting the boys away from the Vararia steel suit, named so after the company that created the very first model. Lusona gave them a little rundown on the specifics as fresh spacesuits were being made for them using a type of superior alien 3D printer. At least, as far as Jean-Francois could tell, that was the best explanation to what that he was told the machines were doing. Lusona had measured and gotten all of the measurements that she needed before beginning her small briefing. So we'll be doing a skirmish, a brawl scenario. This means that it's just a straight up fight. No objectives except for the last one standing. Weapons are tuned down so that we don't actually hurt ourselves or damage the steel suits too severely. What high weapons are available? Barry seemed to be taking this more serious than anything else at the academy up to this point. We are limited to lasers. Real games, however, have missiles, railguns, and melee. For defenses, a Type 7 plasma shield is the primary means of protection. A second layer of armor exists, but for skirmishes, we stop when there is an armor breach or the suit runs out of power. Lusona pointed out on the display the various components of the steel suit. Now, since we're not many, we'll be doing a 3 versus 3 with condensed rolls. Normally, a steel suit is crewed by a pilot, a shield operator, a gunner, and a spotter comms operator. Overseeing the squadron is also a commander. Since we're three, pilot, spotter become one position, while gunner and shield operator become another. A few questions. Jean-Francois raised his hand, hoping to ask before Lusona continued on. How do we pilot those? Also, you mentioned a shield operator, so shields are manual. Lusona changed the display, showing the inside of the steel suit. When you sit down in the seat, which is also being manufactured right now, You'll connect to the steel suit by a very tactile way. These suits are easily replaceable depending on the pilot's size. Your movements will be interpreted by the helmet that you'll wear and be sent to the actions of the steel suit. Hence, a human pilot should be able to pilot a Dwey Dunn steel suit, but you've had much more difficulty. If even able to, with a four-legged and wild steel suit, one for example, the shields are manually controlled by an operator in order to save energy. The operator activates them when they are needed. The laser requires a continuous stream to inflict damage, so you'll need to keep it focused on the enemy. What about the tail? remarked Aura. I don't think that should cause much issue. At worst, you won't be able to use it. We can maybe remove it if it causes trouble, but it helps for balance. Lusona looked behind the humans and waved. Oh good, they're here. The four turned around to look at whoever was approaching. A small black furry creature came into view, making small but quick steps that clicked on the hard metal floor. It wore some open vest and small shorts, a tiny tail swinging at the back. It almost appeared to be related to a sheep family of species, if not for its elongated face that seemed canine in nature. Moving alongside it, a blue alien that could be at best described as some kind of blob, or rather a slime, slid across the floor at the same pace. Izumi's eyes went wide as she saw the small furry creature. Without much warning, she got up and ran towards it, prompting the poor thing to backtrack and run in the other direction. It didn't get far, however, as Izumi's longer legs allowed her to snatch it up. Unhand me, you fell beast! It screamed as she held it tight to her chest, muttering to herself about how cute it was. That is my friend Smilriet. He's the pilot on the team. Introduced Lucerna. Can you, um, please let him go? Izumi relented and put the creature down, its clamped hooves tapping on the floor, making a small clang as she lowered it. Never in my life have I ever, it raged, murmuring under its breath as it got distance between Izumi and itself. Hello, Lasona. How are you today? asked the other creature. I'm good, thank you, Lycos. These are the new students. They're human. This is Barry, Laura, Izumi, and Jean-Francois, she said as she pointed them out for Lycos. The four of them greeted Lycus, using waves or bows. All right, so lastly, the skirmish location is on the flat surface you saw outside the dome. That is the top of the Tarmina station. At random, a few metal plates will be raised, allowing for cover. Lusona closed the display and began walking towards the steel suit. Now for teams, 
I'll need a gunner for my team, and the other three will be able to use a backup steel suit. Avaton, I'm not gonna lie, it's rather inferior to Namidian, but we're just going to this match for fun and practice. Yeah, is your friend not playing? Mizumi was afraid that she had scared the other alien by her show of affection. Smurly it is, but not like us. Her kind, the Kusid, don't do well with these kind of environments. Usually, most species have certain positions they excel at for Steel Squadron, but hers simply don't use them. Uh, I would like to try take Gunner, proposed Barry. I've got a few guns back at home, and I played a bunch of shooters back in the day. Well, I'll be hunting a few times with my uncle. He used to work for Heckler and Cock, so I've had a chance to see a few guns. I think I should be the other gunner, added Laura. Jean-Francois and Izumi nodded their understanding. Izumi was next to speak. Well, I've never gotten my driver's license, so I don't think I'd be a good pilot. If you don't mind doing it, Jean-Francois. It's fine by me. I've often wondered about how virtual reality could go, and this seems a great moment to experience. The Cerner stopped in front of the Numidian, a dray-done steel suit, and smiled. After hearing this short bit of history, she really wanted to see how well they'd do it a steel suit. The machine signaled that it had finished its job, and she walked over, retrieving four spacesuits for the humans. Let us suit up. In the dome, red lights flashed, indicating the beginning of a steel squadron match. Secondary dome projection projections became active, raising another partial dome around the main one. Out on the top of the station, large metallic plates were raised from the station structure, creating an artificial battlefield. Atop the dome, two small rooms occupied the topmost space. Giving a view of the full battlefield, Lusona sat in the top one, overlooking the entire station, and began readying herself for the match. As commander, she wouldn't have much to do in the skirmish like this, but in official games, she'd be analyzing the situation, formulating a plan, researching enemy steel suit capabilities, and communicating with her own steel suit. The elevator dinged, signaling that it had reached the floor, and someone exited it, his heavy footsteps reverberating through the floor. Hello, father. A short, tired grunt was all the reply as her father let himself down gently onto the soft floor cushions that surrounded the small room. The stable doors opened, letting out the first steel suit, the spare one that Jean-Francois was piloting. It moved rather clumsily and without any grace. He moved to the other end of the field, taking cover as they waited for the game's start. A few minutes later, giving time for the first team to choose position, the Namidian stepped out, gracefully moving to a good pace with the skillful piloting of its pilot, Smyrniet. I'm still surprised that you managed to convince Smyrniet to pilot for you. He is uh, pretty good, remarked her father. What are you playing against? He added after the pause. The son took a deep breath. The match was about to begin. The new students. The humans. Down in the lounge area of the dome, Xenos were getting ready for some entertainment as the Steel Squadron game was about to start. Many stopped what they were doing and headed to the windows in order to better see the match. Looks like the Dway Dunn stable is having a practice match. They'll need it if they hope to make the finals this year. Ha! <laughs> yeah, their performance last year was abysmal. I'm surprised they didn't lose their funding. The Avatar are pretty rough around the edges. You part it probably. Bet you five CNPC they don't even last five minutes. Ha! I'll take that bet. A high-pitched single-note sound rang through the dome, indicating that the match was about to begin. Only one floor down from Lusona, Izumi was in a similar room to her enemy commander, able to see great distances and the entirety of the battlefield. Lysona had briefly mentioned that this was similar to being in orbit and having satellite assistance, granting a bird's-eye view of the full battlefield to the commander. Testing, testing, uh, do you receive me? She spoke to the communication device in front of her. It was linked to the computer. Not and clear, came reply from Laura and John francois Okay, the match is starting. The enemy is at your nine o'clock, moving in your direction. It took a moment for John francois to situate himself, turning around to change his position, getting a bit more used to the controls. He peeked from behind the metallic paddle and advanced as he saw no one. On the other side, moving much more fluidly, 
The Nemidian made its way towards its target with the assistance of its commander. Okay, stop. They're right on the other side of this panel. Maybe flank them? Izumi wasn't sure what they needed to do, but it sounded like the best move. Obviously, a role like commander would shine more during a bigger engagement. As a team began moving around to get the enemy's rear, Izumi was surprised by the enemy's movements. The Midian jumped up high, gaining height advantage on the backup steel suit. As soon as it landed next to the Avaton, the Nemidian began firing its laser weapon. To Jean-Francois's credit, he managed to react rapidly enough, dashing to the right while Laura activated the shields on the side receiving the laser fire. The damage was minimal, but helped put the Nemidian on the offensive. It kept it up, following the Avaton while its gunner tried to keep him in the laser lock. A fast-paced exchange followed, lasers striking the exterior armor briefly before shields fell in place cancelling the laser with a high-density plasma. The plasma shielding used more energy than the lasers, making defensive turtling a bad idea. Jean-Francois kept his steel suit in motion, trying to make Barry work harder to get a solid hits on him. The superior maneuverability of the Numidian meant that Laura had to work harder than Barry in order to keep the weapon focused. Jean-Francois darted behind some cover, buying some time. Izumi gave Numidian's position but there wasn't much that he could do with that information because Lucerna was also giving his position. He started getting more used to the Abaton's responses, his movements becoming slightly more fluid with time as he ran around, trying to let Laura get shots in while he focused on trying to be hard to hit. It was a mixed success. He was able to use the shields less, but Laura was missing more of her shots. Damn it! Stop moving so much, jean Laura screamed as she switched the shields to the left arm, cancelling out the Midian's laser ever so briefly. I can't. If I don't try and dodge some of those, then we'll run out of power. Jean-Francois was at a loss at what to do. His machine was inferior to the enemy's, and his lack of familiarity with it did not help. He thought about rushing it, maybe catching it off guard and throwing it on the ground, but remembered that melee was off the table for the skirmish. The Avaton's energy reserves depleted mere moments later, the steel suit grinding down to a halt. Disappointed, Laura and Jean-Francois waited in the steel suit as it towed back to the hangar. Up above in the commander's post, Lissona's father stood up. Well, uh, that was a tad underwhelming. He looked at the game's statistics sheet as he scratched his chin. Although the the Remedian gunner had a fairly good accuracy with 82% continuous laser uptime, that's a fair bit above the league average. You should look into adding him to the roster. Her father was right. She'd have to have Barry get into a team tomorrow. She had expected a good showing from the humans, but she was left more impressed than she initially thought. Even the gunner and the grand champion Enoir team fed her only had an accuracy of 72% without using computer-assisted targeting. And you know what? I never even told them that there's computer-assisted targeting. Both gunners were simply using manual controls. She entered the elevator, leaving with a smug look on her face as her father blinked rapidly in visible disbelief. Down below, the spectators in the dome returned activities, having enjoyed the temporary entertainment. Hey, five minutes and twenty-eight seconds, you owe me five credits, jeered one of the Xenos. The other rolled its eight eyes and shook its head. Decidedly, that had been a bad wager. Back in the hangar, the pilots exited their steel suits while removing their helmets. It had been a short time, but rather strenuous activity. If Jean-Francois had to compare it to something human, he'd have said bumper cars on steroids. Lissona and Izumi had come down from the dome in order to meet up with the others. No, dang, sorry girls, I wish I'd be even better, Jean-Francois hung his head low. Hey, that was actually a fairly good first showing, Lissona said as she did her best smile. Yeah, it was a ton of fun, even if we wouldn't have won, added Barry. I might have have to say, this sport is better than hockey. If we had this on Earth, I'm sure it'd replace baseball as America's favorite pastime. La Sona is right. For the first time effort, it was pretty good. With some training, however, you could maybe make it into the lower division, Steel Scorpion League. Smurliant kept his distance from Azumi as he joined in the conversation. You got any water around here? That was a pretty good workout, and I'm parched. Jean Francois looked around, but saw only machines and tools. Lissona motioned for everyone to follow her. Oh, yeah. 
Let me buy you all a drink. At first, I was rather skeptical when she had mentioned drink, but were pleasantly surprised when they had sat down on the second level of the dome to find an actual bar-like area. Lusona ordered something called Setus, which she had explained was a juice of a hard shell fruit for all of them. You know, I'm really happy there's at least juice. I don't know how long I could have gone with just water. Jean-Francois returned to his drink, emptying it in a few quick gulps. I'm glad you like it. These ones are a bit expensive, though, so maybe don't get too used to them. They're only grown on a planet very far from here, so availability isn't very common. There are other types of juices that cost a lot less. Oh, yeah, how, how does money work for you guys? Like, uh, does every species have their own thing, or is there some kind of universal currency? Barry had put away his drink, focusing all of his attention on the sonar. It'll vary where you find yourself. Everyone except CNPC, which stands for Carbon Nanotube Plating Credit, but most also have their own currencies. Governments have agreed on a standard measurement for a plate of this material, whose value derives from being used in almost all space constructions of large scales due to the tensile strength. One CNPC is worth one thirty-one of a plate, but we don't actually carry those around. We have digital devices that store them. So it's a bit like when we used to have the gold standard. How rare are these carbon nanotubes? inquired Laura. They're uh, not rare. Uh, they're, they're useful. Speaking of money, however, Barry, there's something I'd like to discuss with you in private. Lysona got up, beckoning Barry to follow her. The others began making small talk as the two of them left, occasionally looking at a replay of the match on the screen above their head. Well, I suppose we should find a way to earn some of those CNPC. I'm intrigued at what the exchange rate would be for euros, wondered John Francois. Assuming that we can make this material likely high, but it'll depend on what the standard measurement is for a plate, added Laura. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. One species could be willing to pay a lot for something native to Earth. The trick will be finding out more about what every species wants and likes, Izumi said and stood up. But for today, I'm going to go and sleep. It's been a long one. Laura and Jean-Francois waved goodbye to Izumi as she walked towards the elevator. They waited a bit, but Lysona seemed to be having a rather long conversation with Barry, who was listening and not talking. Looking at his laptop, Jean-Francois realized that there were only seven odd hours before the start of the next class. Well, um, I suppose I could get going as well. Today was fun. I hope we get to do it again. He waved goodbye to Laura, heading to his room. End of story. Chapter 8 Soft, synthetic piano music started playing as Laura slept. Small, high-pitched notes reverberated, almost creating bubbles of electronic sound. The crystal-clear sound emanating from the alarm that she had set up the night prior began to stir her from her slumber. Then, with a deafening cacophony, a loud siren erupted, changing the overall feel of the song. As the siren wound down, the electronic notes came back followed by some drums. Finally, a voice could be discerned behind all the heavy instruments. Gedaldled that, that, schmerz and gent. Heavy and coarse, the voice sang the lyrics harshly, with little to no emotion. Laura's eyes opened regrettingly, wishing that she had gotten a bit more rest. The song continued on, regardless of Laura's wishes. One fur dust the heart vibrant. A bit more life in the lyrics could be heard. Slightly more on the side of anger or frustration. She moved her head, flexing her neck gently and pushed herself up. Ich werf in Licht. A yawn escaped as she adjusted herself to a sitting position. She rotated her head clockwise. The same with both of her wrists. The tendons and joints stretched, making small, audible pumps. Then mein Gesicht, mein Heber, strain. Jills made their way down Laura's spine in the form of a shiver. A frisson as to all the familiar lyrics made themselves heard, dredging up powerful emotions. For your fray, the song erupted into a loud mix of drums, guitar, and electronic music. The initial loud siren almost made its return, although not drowning out every other instrument this time. Bang! Bang! She waited for the refrain to kick in before shutting off the alarm. Fully woken up now, she started her morning routine. Fetching her bag, she opened it and took out a toothbrush, using the refillable bottle of water 
She dipped it in and applied a small, dot-sized amount of toothpaste, brushing her teeth. Rinsing it out, she then grabbed one of the remaining four protein bars that she had left from Earth. She told herself to remember to grab extra provisions to keep in her room. If Jean-Francois's cooking venture held any promise, she'd likely try and copy that. Chewing on a protein bar, she changed her clothes and readied herself for glass, having taken a bath the night before. At least most aliens had heard of hygiene, she thought, having been pleased at finding a bath-like structure attached to her room. She made her way towards the glass with ten minutes to spare, then was delighted to find four human-sized seats. Looking over a laptop, this class was supposed to delve on diplomacy and was taught by a teacher they hadn't yet had, a Mrs. Muldron. A few students walked past her and took their seats, mostly ignoring her. She wished she could be slightly more social, better able to interact with other species, but she was shy. Perhaps awkward was a better word than shy. She did have friends, after all. But how to approach a completely foreign species? What did they have in common? Did they even have small talk? Class started to fill up slowly, but surely as she pondered those questions in her head, Chin resting inside her palm, a hand touched his shoulder and she looked up to see Izumi. Ah, good morning, announced Laura. Good morning, as well, replied Izumi. Sleep well. As much as one can be expected. I think I earned a few bruises from the steel suit exercise we did, however. Laura looked at her hands, a few bruises present on the palm of her hands from gripping the controls tightly. Izumi nodded in agreement. I was only watching from above, but I expected it must have been rough, moving fast and suddenly like you did. I wonder how the boys fared. As if on cue, Barry and Jean-Francois entered the classroom, amongst the last group of students to do so, taking their place behind the girls. Speak of the devil, they also look worse for wear, remarked Laura. Isn't it warm? Why is Barry wearing a long-sleeved shirt with a hood? asked Izumi questioningly which made Laura notice how Barry had a few bruises and scratches on his face. It appeared that the steel suit match had left its mark on the boys as well. Laura did a double take when she looked at Barry's hoodie more closely. She blinked twice to try and tell herself that she had not seen correctly, but the image stayed the same. She facepalmed and muttered something to herself about stupid Americans. I know the aliens can't read it, but why did this idiot bring a hoodie with thick thighs save lives on the goddamn space voyage? The students stopped talking as the teacher closed the door, signaling that class would be beginning soon. Mrs. Moulton bent her tentacles together, like someone interlacing their fingers. Hello, class. I see some new faces in the room. Excellent. I have been anxiously and nervously expecting you. Let me introduce myself to those who are new. I'm Mrs. Muldron, and I teach natural sciences and diplomacy. As a matter of fact, just a few days ago, we had a biology class where you were our main subject. The human students were a bit surprised at this. Laura lifted a hand to ask a question. Mrs. Muldron pointed at her with one of her eight tentacles. What do you mean by that? Well, you're a newly discovered species, the first one in nearly 400 years. Everyone was quite curious about you. It was important to try and glean some details of what your species is like, for how we interact with you. We had some basic information provided by your internet, but much of it was unreliable and without sources. One of the students lifted her appendage, wishing to speak. Once granted, she quickly uttered, It's been exactly 362 years since the first contact encounter. Thank you, Zargiel. I must say that I'm disappointed that Mr. Florge broached the subject matter of your history first, and in a manner that he did. However, we can now do it the right way, examining what we have in common instead of what makes humans different. How can we do that? asked Jean-Francois. Perhaps you four could clarify a few things for us. I browsed your internet briefly, trying to find pertinent information, but many articles seem to contradict each other, so I only use those that seem to be the most reliable in previous class. Mrs. Maldron paused for a moment before resuming. I had initially thought to simply make your internet available to all students, but some of the contents were uh, rather distasteful nature. So much so, that I had to report it to the education board, and they have since moved it under a level 3 quarantine. She shivered momentarily after remembering her experiences. What is a level 3 quarantine? Mary asked, quite curious. It's to prevent someone from coming across it by accident. A level 3 quarantine necessitates a special permit, 
which can be granted after passing a written test, in order to make sure that the written material will not traumatize the reader. Well, I always knew the internet was toxic cesspool of depravity, but it had never dawned on me that it would be regarded as that bad, Barry laughed as he said it. Izumi seemed to take this as not quite as well as the others. I hope they don't judge us too harshly for this. Mrs. Malter became apologetic. No, no, ju- judgment is not being done. It is simply what is we surprised your species with a visit, and they welcomed us immediately with open arms, helping the wounded from the accidental crash on their planet. First contact with other species usually takes much longer, giving them time to cleanse away all documents that shine a bad light in them before sharing their information and databases with us. Today's class was supposed to be about history, one of the subjects under the umbrella of diplomacy. It is important to know the history of a species in order to know how to conduct good diplomacy. It also helps in better understanding the culture and personality of a species. I think just about everyone would like to know more about humans, if I'm not mistaken. The claws voiced their agreement. That might be a bit hard to do. Humans aren't united like many of you seem to be. Um, We'll uh, still divide it across many states that each have their own culture, Laura stated. That is understandable. We are looking for shared human traits and preferences that can apply to all humans. What about governing systems? Divided there too. Um, a large amount of us have democracies, a few have oligarchies, others communism, and even fewer have monarchies. Jean Francois shrugged as he said so. Very interesting. We also vary by species. Mine also uses an oligarchy, but we have a fair share of monarchies and technocracies across the spectrum of the other species. Mrs. Moldrum smiled as she recanted. What kind of government do you have in your own tribes? Asked one of the students. We're all under democracies, although Barry's country would almost be considered an oligarchy, Laura said deadpan. Barry's obvious facial disagreement spoke volumes. So anyone at all can become your leader, continued the student who had asked the question. Well, um, yes and no. No one's ever won without being part of one of the main parties. You need money to run a campaign, connections to get your name known, and etc., replied Barry, trying to save face for his country. The class was silent for a moment until another student asked a question. Do humans have any sort of rituals, for example, before sleeping? My species always offers a prayer to the creators. Well, uh, most would be religious in nature, I think, like praying or baptism, right guys? Barry looked at the others for advice. At the mention of religion, the alien female appeared to have shocked reaction, but it quickly changed into one of excited joy. Ah, there we go. The Lumiel also have a belief system in the supernatural, believing that a precursor species has seeded all known life in the universe. So far, there were only ones with such a trait. The teacher seemed pleased to find some common ground, however archaic it was. No, I can't wait to tell my people about you. We will make a pilgrimage to your home world as soon as possible. We've not had others to speak of theology with for eons. Oh no. What have we done? Are we responsible for the religious walls that may follow? Laura's heart sank in her stomach and she felt sick to her core. This is like when the Catholics discovered the new world, except space Jehovah's Witnesses would find Earth. Well, aside from that, cultural rituals do exist, I suppose. Things like handshaking or, or uh, birthdays. Maybe bowing instead of handshaking in some countries, added Jean Francois, trying to steer the conversation away from religion. Taking shoes off before entering a house, funerals, eating together, dating. We've got many rituals when we think about it added Izumi, piggybacking on Jean Francois's train of thought. What do you mean by ceremony for the dead? asked Mrs. Moulton with a genuine touch of confusion. Funeral, um, yeah, you know, burial, cremation, those types of things. What do you do when someone dies? questioned Jean Francois. We process the body, of course. It is the most efficient thing to do, said Mrs. Moulton without an ounce of warmth. Wait, what do you mean by process? Barry's eyebrows raised as he asked the question. We use it as a protein for the carnival species diet, of course. We've been eating people. Oh, God, I think I'm going to be sick. Jean Francois's face contorted, and he began taking short, sharp breaths. Don't those species have farms for raising livestock? Laura seemed flabbergasted by the prospect of eating a sapient creatures as well. Naturally, but we aren't always close to one of those worlds. We do synthesize the majority of the protein but this helps us save some of that, stated Mrs. Moldron. Yeah, that's gotta be enough for me, 
Humans don't eat sapient species. Barry thought of dolphins and squids, remembering that those are highly intelligent. The vast majority of us don't anyways. Barry looked at the class and saw Lysana giving him a wink. Well, this has been quite informative, but we're going a bit off topic now. What about social dynamics? How are human communities and your relations with your progenitors? You know, uh, once again, that's going to be very a lot. Uh, some humans are very close to the parents. Others break off as soon as they can. Initially, most couples that have children do so willingly. It can happen accidentally, however, but sometimes they end up separating from each other due to different reasons. Where I'm from, the most common arrangement tends to be a male and a female with two children. As far as communities, you buy or rent a house from a neighborhood that you like or can afford, preferably not too far from work or other amenities. Barry had taken over Jean-Francois's spot as the latter had left the room quite urgently mere moments ago. The child stays with the parents for how long? asked the luminous student. Izumi answered it. Traditionally, it's up to 18 years old or completion of secondary studies. Some may spend their entire lives in their parents' home, however. We call those hikikomoris in my language. The students murmured amongst themselves, shocked at how long children stayed with their parents. They spend nearly twenty years learning and under their parents' wing. It would drive me mad. That probably explains why they only have two offspring if they stay for that long. Mrs. Muldron had managed to bring back the relative calm, raising her tentacles and slowly bringing them down. You have strong family ties, then. Someone like the Enoir, where offspring often follow their family for half of their life before making their own family. Laura addressed Mrs. Muldron. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you're looking for is more similar to etiquette. Ah, customary code of polite behavior. That would do quite nicely. There is a general human etiquette. It'd be a very small list as many things change from one culture to another. In general, don't be rude, don't stare, provide assistance if it is required. It is polite to face the person that you are talking to. Humans tend to enjoy some personal space when possible. It's considered rude to not offer a guest refreshments. Things like that. But honestly, seeing as you're aliens and not humans, I'm not sure how many of those that we'd hold you accountable to. Laura shrugged her shoulders, not knowing how to solve this issue without dealing with humans. This may be a bit more difficult than I anticipated. All right, let's take a small recess and reconvene in 72 minutes. Students stood up in order to leave the classroom when, without warning, an explosion knocked everyone down. The shockwave reverberated throughout the station. An alarm began shouting, and everyone panicked. End of chapter. Jean-Francois dry heaved as his face stared at the depths of the bipedal bathroom's toilets. On a normal day, he didn't like thinking about how meat found its way onto his plate. Knowing that that particular meat had been eating used to be someone was magnitudes worse. As he began seriously thinking of going vegan for the length of his stay at Tarmina, the whole station shook violently, splashing back at him the vomit that he'd just hurled, causing him to repeat the cycle. When everything was absolutely out of his system, he realized that there was some kind of alarm going off. Very quickly, he washed away most of what had splashed on his shirt with some water and exited the bathroom. Out in the corridors, panic was set as various crew members, faculty staff, and students ran from one side to the other. In the chaos that was ensuing, Jean-Francois watched as a smaller student, a Deamede, fell down as it connected with another Zeno who was moving fast. He made his way to it and helped to get up, the creature being only slightly taller than a meter. Hey, uh, you okay? What's happening? He knelt down next to it, offering his hand to help it up. The little Deamede's heart and its breathing was intensified, but it managed to grab his hand and get itself up. It's the Yashani. They, we need to find somewhere to hide. Jean-Francois scratched his head and tried thinking quickly. That loud explosion. The panic. Could it be an attack? He tried prying more information out of the satire-like creature. What are the Yashani? Why do we need to hide? The panicked Aemid's little eyes darted across the corridors, looking through the crowds, trying to find something. Readers, look, we don't... The little creature yelped in surprise and darted off as fast as his little legs could carry it. Jean-Francois tried to stop it, but the Daymead was gone before he could. Turning around to look in the direction that the Xena was looking in, he nearly had a heart attack. Down the corridor, standing over seven feet tall, 
was a group of alien-looking plants making their way towards him with something that looked like a weapon held in their hand. A stark contrast to the very natural-looking bodies. Their roots, three of them, slithered forwards, each one at a time. Jean-Francois watched with some morbid fascination as slower crew members, likely some kind of electrician judging by the equipment it carried, tripped and fell in the corridor. The plant-like alien moved over to the Xena when branch-like tendrils picked up the electrician, bringing him to its body and absorbing him. Jean-Francois was broken out of his staring at the scene, instincts telling him to run. At first, he thought of returning to the classroom to warn the others, but what good would that do? Instead, he made his way to the dome. Please calm down, Mrs. Muldron, trying to get the semblance of order in the class as every student save the humans was panicking. A few stopped looking at the teacher for guidance, making others less agitated by proxy. Now, now, remember the drills, everything will be fine. She used a serene voice, trying to get them to drop out of their current state of mind. She gestured for everyone to regain their seats. Remember the Ishani want hostages. It will not make sense for them to kill you. Um... Several questions come to mind here, Laura interjected from the corner of the classroom. Barry nodded and added, Yeah, I'm out of the loop here too. All right, that would explain why you seem so calm, Mrs. Maldron remembered, that they had arrived later and missed the formal orientation and most students go through. The Yushani homeworld was destroyed many years ago, as they could not get along with other species. Now their remnants are pirates and opportunists, raiding merchants and uh, ransoming hostages. So armed aliens are coming to take us as hostages, asked Laura. That's the gist of it, yes, sir. I can see you're worried. They do keep their word, insisted Mrs. Muldron. Well, uh, they even have a school shootings in space. I'm starting to really feel at home here, remarked Barry, the hint of sarcasm largely going all of the Xeno's head. Behind that, however, Barry's mind was thinking about how his government's approach to negotiating with terrorist threats was. They simply did not, and was not looking forward to being taken as a hostage. Now, let's be quiet and perhaps they will not find us. Mrs. Maldron locked the door to the class using a small electrical pad to the side. But what good that would do? Everyone was either sitting down, resigned to their fate, or trying to hide behind something. Aside from a few whispers and hushed conversations, the class was eerily silent, hoping to pass unnoticed. Their efforts were in vain, however, as the Yushani were going door to door looking for someone in particular. The door rattled, something having hit it or tried prying it open. Many of the students simply stared straight ahead, too scared to move while others looked around, trying to find a spot that they could hide. Yeah, I'm not going down without a fight, Barry said out loud to no one in particular as he began hitting his chest with his right hand. What's he doing? asked a curious Lasana, watching Barry strike his chest with his fist in a repeated motion. I think, um... He's trying to force an adrenaline rush, replied Azumi. What is that? Another of the students that was seated next to him asked. I couldn't tell you the specifics offhand, just like that, but it's a chemical in our bloodstream that helps us temporarily get stronger, faster, breathe better, dulls pain, etc. Part of our fight or flight mechanism. Barry's decided that he wants to fight, so he's trying to trick his brain into thinking he's in danger, so that he's better prepared. Ah! I don't think we need much tricking right now. Laura let out a small, sarcastic laugh, looking at the door and hearing the raiders fiddle with it. Barry stopped the masochistic ritual and went next to the door, putting his shoulder on the wall next to it, while keeping the front of his body, facing the door, but out of sight of it. The Yushini finally managed to get the wiring hack that they needed to open the door, or at least unlock it. A branch-like hand protruded from the door, pushing it open. Barry wasted no time and tackled the first intruder through the door, both of them falling to the floor. The alien fell with a thud. Its tall frame meant that its head hit the wall first, then smashed down on the floor as Barry landed on it. Using the opportunity, Barry began wailing on it with his fists. Soft, wet crunches from the plant matter being crushed sounded audibly to everyone in the classroom. From behind the door, another one of the Xenos aimed a weapon at Barry and fired a small needle-like projectile which buried itself in Barry's right shoulder, the syringe emptying the contents in him. Barry shrugged it off, knocking aside the projectile with his left hand, too focused to care. The Yushine on the floor tried to reach for his weapon, but Barry kicked it away and then began reaching for its branch-like limbs. 
With a savage snap, he broke the creature's appendage, hoping that it would prevent it from trying to reach again or defend it from blows. With its appendage broken, the Yushinae could not stop Barry as he reached around and clawed out chunks of him with his bare hands, throwing bits and pieces of him to the floor. Laura and Izumi followed soon after the second one shot Barry, each grabbing one of it and pulling it into the classroom. Close the door, Laura shouted to the teacher, who reacted slowly from the shock of the scene playing out in the classroom. Together they threw down the Yushinae and Laura straddled it, using her hands to try and control it. Using that time, Azumi swung at the creature at the Laura was holding with a chair, whacking it repeatedly in what appeared to be its face. His hands now colored green and dripping from unknown fluids, Barry stepped away from the no longer moving Yeshine after giving it a final kick. He approached the one on the ground, which was managing to resist Laura and partially block Azumi's chair swings, and stepped with his talon at the center of its mass. Its sickening crunch resonating and Barry kept at it, the green mulch warming on the ground where its body used to be from the strikes of his shoes, which were now covered with green goop. You fucking piece of crap, you shoot me, huh? The wet slush sound continued, Barry striking the pile that was the Yushinae with continued vigor until Laura put a hand on his shoulder. Taking a deep breath, he sat down at his place and looked at his feet. His formerly white Nike Air Monarch will likely be on even the most intense cleaning session. Pain now came back. The moment having passed and he rubbed his shoulder. Anyone know what was in that? Izumi fetched the other weapon, which hadn't been shot yet, and brought it to the teacher. Taking the ammunition out, Mrs. Maldron looked it over a small vial. Ah, this is C-17H21NO4. A compound which overloads postsynaptic receptors to shut them down, making targets easy to pick up. It's mostly harmless in the dosage amount. Barry should gently fall asleep soon. Um, you sure? Because my heart rate is fast and I can't stop shaking. Oh well, I've never felt so alive! Fuck! Any more of them, I'd fight another. Yeah! Yeah! Barry was twitching restlessly, his head turning and looking everywhere. Most students seem to be more scared of him than the raiders by this point. I'm not sure, but I think I've heard of that somewhere else before. Izumi went and fetched her laptop, making a quick search on her offline copy of Wikipedia. Her eyebrows furrowed as she read the article and then gasped slightly. They shot him with cocaine. End of chapter. Running down the corridor, Jean-Francois looked behind every so often to make sure that those strange plant aliens were not following him. Many thoughts raced through his mind, such as the fate of the alien that had been absorbed in a plant-like life form, but for the sake of his sanity, he tried to clear his brain of it. The side of the station seemed almost deserted, having only come across glimpses of three other alien backs as they ran in other directions than him. Seeing no one else head towards where he was heading worried him somewhat, but it remained the best course of action in his mind. Soon... He reached the domed entrance and found the doors to be unlocked, to his relief. The dome was rather quiet, and he opened the doors. Most had fled to the open area to hide elsewhere. Still, a few sat at the bar, either oblivious to the situation or without a care in the world. Jean-Francois paid them no attention and headed straight for his goal, the steel suit hangar. Unluckily, however, these doors were locked and he had no idea of how to open them. After fiddling with the electronic box next to the door to no avail, he opted to try and find someone from the teams in order to open the doors, so he headed for the bar area. On second thought, it was perhaps an onerous to associate it as a bar since alcohol was clearly not part of this creature on board's diet. What else would one call a half-moon crescent counter where customers sat and drank a juice bar? Once there, he quickly recognized one of the regulars. Hey, you're, um, uh, a day of maid. Semerit, Lissona's team pilot, right? He hoped that it was indeed the right person, and he hadn't just done a faux pas of essentially saying they all looked alike. The day of maid lowered its beverage and squinted at the human. It's similar yet, human. What are you doing here anyways? Don't you know that we're getting boarded as we speak? Exactly. I had an idea. Can we use the steel suits to destroy their spaceship? It has to be docked somewhere on the station. Then, while with no way to retreat, we'll be in a good position to negotiate, exclaimed Jean-Francois, full of enthusiasm. The day Amide sighed. 
They'll be gone soon enough. Why go through all of the risk? Just sit here, have a drink, and wait for it all to blow over. Jean-Francois shook his head negatively. I just left the class to go to the bathroom. I came across one of these raiders on the way back. I have to do something. I can't let them do anything to the class. Oh, you persistent human. I won't let you drag me into this. Here, you can go be heroically suicidal, wannabe hero on your own. Selmul Riet handed him a small, flat, circular-shaped metal object. That's the authentication you'll need to open up the hangar doors. Steel suit itself isn't locked up. Jean-Francois hastily grabbed the offered object and uttered a quick thanks before he sprinted towards the hangar, key in hand. The doors opened without a fuss, and he darted straight to the familiar steel suit he piloted the other day. But, like driving for a second time, Jean-Francois tried to remember exactly how it was done the first time around, but with limited success. He'd gotten in, managed to get into the seat, but was at a loss on how to proceed further. Only difference was that it had already been started for them that time. They'd only needed to get in. Time was ticking, and he added stress did not help. Making a pressure, Jean-Francois looked around wildly in order to figure out how to start the damn thing. As frustration mounted and turned into despair, a voice called out to him, Figures, move over, I'll show you how it's done. Similariet climbed aboard and began his sequence activation, the seal suit. Now go fetch me my chair. This thing's way too big for me. In the classroom, Lissona was still not quite over the fact that little Barry over there, nearly half her height and likely no more than a third of her weight, had managed to whip himself up into a frenzy and overpower those pirates. She felt somewhat conflicted over the matter, as she loved the general idea of someone saving a damsel in distress, but also guilty, because if it were not for her presence, they likely would have avoided this particular classroom. Being the most valuable hostage, aside from her father, on the station meant that she felt particularly targeted by these recent events. So, this is done for now, so we should probably head for somewhere else now, Laura asked the teacher. Mrs. Stroudron, still digesting the violence that had occurred in the classroom, acknowledged Laura's idea. I am afraid you might be right. I have no idea what the other pirates' reaction would be to what has happened here, but I cannot presume to think that it would be, um, civil. We must seek refuge elsewhere. Taking a pause, she then spoke to Izumi. How is Barry doing? Is he state stable? Izumi, who was checking up on Barry, left his side and approached the front of the class, looking at Mrs. Maldron. He is all right for now. I'll get better over time. Can you give us some information about the pirates? Are they a type of plant species like they seem? Anything about their biology that you could explain? I fail to see how it will help, but very well. Let's move first, and then I'll teach you everything I know about the Yashani. There is a room not too far from here where we store seldom used objects that still have a purpose. Mrs. Maldron headed for the door, opening it slightly and peeking outside. Satisfied, she waved to the class to follow her. The giant conga lion of students slipped out of the classroom towards the small storage room, fitting inside but being rather cramped. Everyone held their breaths, listening and watching for any possible sign that they were heard or seen coming here. Seconds turned into minutes as students slowly lowered their guard and began talking amongst themselves in hushed tones. The humans gathered around Mrs. Maldron, and Lucerna made sure to be stood not too far away. She had to admit that she liked the way that the humans tended to find themselves in the middle of every situation, poised to take on leadership roles or just get stuff done. Looking at her fellow students, she was disappointed by the lack of action. However, she understood that many of them were simply raised this way. Let me see what I can remember about the Yashine, began Mrs. Maldron, they initially evolved as patient predators, ambushers of sorts. By standing very still, they could become invisible to local fauna and had mainly a movement-based vision. So, some kind of carnivorous plant, inquired Izumi. Well, their diet was complemented by this. Their main way to gain energy, however, was the remains of photosynthesis. Some believe that it is an extra addition of energy, from their ambushes that enabled them to develop further motor functions and eventually become mobile. Laura twirled a finger in her hair that seemed lost in thoughts. Interesting. That gives me an idea. Izumi prodded Laura for more. Well, can you tell us more? It's coming together in my head. We're going to need bait, access to electrical grid, and a room. Lissona was quite intrigued by Laura's demands and plan, 
but felt a tinge of worry when both human girls turned to look at her simultaneously. Do you have any idea where the pirate ship could be? I dare remind you again the size of the space station, asked Simulriot, the annoyance dripping from every word. Ah, uh, well, I would say not too far from the classroom, I think. Alarm sounded just before they were seen there. Now, where is it exactly on the outside? I have no idea, replied Jean-Francois, a bit defeated. The steel suit piloted by Damon was progressing smoothly. Its magnetic locks behaving well and the small pilot skill was apparent with how much ground that they were covering. Jean-Francois had set up on the weapons, ready for a fight that had yet to come. Look, even if we find it, those lasers are tuned down quite a lot. There is not going to be much damage to that ship, remarked Simulirate. Jean-Francois nodded. There's a good chance the laser might not work, true. If that happens, then we could just use brute force. When realization of what the human meant came to Simulirate, he hit him like a train. You don't mean... They're going to shoot us before we can get to do what you think we're going to do. If they're docked, it'll be mighty hard to do. If they're docked, it'll be mighty hard to shoot us. And if they undock to shoot us, that means the pirates are stuck on the station and no one is getting kidnapped. Then it's just a matter of time until we get reinforcements, right? You make it sound cut and dry. It's hardly anything but a foolproof plan. I... Look, don't talk anymore. You're going to give me an aneurysm. Similariot shook his head and tried to change the strain of thought. The worst part was that the way the human explained, it was starting to make sense to him, but he knew that it was folly. Somehow, though, Jean-Francois had managed to plant a seed in his mind that this was actually possible to pull off. Having adjusted the steel suit's trajectory, the diamond kept an eye over the horizon, looking for anything that might feel out of place. The longer they could manage to stay undetected, the best their odds were. If they managed to actually pull it off, though, commendations would be thrown their way. Perhaps the prestige and fame from this would be enough to earn him citizenship back. A few minutes later, the Yishune ship was finally within view. Carefully, Similariot positioned the steel suit so that it blended in with the external equipment from the station, using it as cover as they approached. The Daemide exhaled and then took a deep breath. All right, get ready. This is a hit and run. Aim for weapons and the engines. We're not setting up shop down here. Let's see if your accuracy is as good as your buddy, Barry. Jean-Francois gripped the controls tightly. The challenge was on. Say that again, almost shouted Lucerna. Laura tried to use her hands to gesture her to calm down. We need someone to lure the pirates in a particular location. They would have a hard time shooting you with their scales, and we need them to want the target. If I'm not mistaken, your father is a diplomat, yeah? So that would make you some sort of high target, I think. Seeing how Lusona didn't seem convinced, Laura added, We won't let anything happen to you. We'll be right here. Izumi also stepped in. The rest of the plan, you understand it, right? I do, but it's going to take a long time. Are you sure you can pull that off? It was another unorthodox type of plan, to be sure, thought Lusona. Barry approached and put a hand on her arm. I guarantee it. Ah, fine. You'll owe me for this, though. She was going to agree to it anyway, but why not get something out of it while at it? Laura nodded and started giving out orders, everyone going to the position. The door opened and Lucerna headed out, picking up a good deal of pace and making sure her footsteps resonated loudly. It didn't take long for her to pick up a trail. Three Yeshine started heading her way, slithering rapidly with their vines. Lysona did not look behind, keeping a focus on her pace. It would serve no purpose to see how many chased her. She needed all of them, after all. Turning around would only cause them to attempt and tranquilize her, due to her softier underbelly. The chase itself would not last long either, else they would split in order to corner her. She pressed on, passing an intersection where she saw more Yushine join the chase from the corner of her eyes. She proceeded to carry them on a defined path for many minutes, creating a pattern that would prevent chasing enemies from being able to cut her off. Rowdy the next corner, Lysona saw one of her fellow students open the side door and give her a signal that she'd been waiting for. She made her way towards the designated area, winning her legs to keep moving, exhaustion and muscle fatigue setting in. She was nearly at her destination, the door to the room held open by another student at the end of the corridor, 
when her knee gave in and twisted, causing her to fall down. Her heart sank as she struggled to get back up, her precious distance between her and the pirates evaporating rapidly. Struggling, she got back up, but only managed to limp forward as much as a reduced pace. A powerful sense of dread began to make its way through her thoughts. She had failed her friends and the academy. Who knew what the Yushine would do to her now? She managed to keep staring ahead, not wanting to look behind and lose all hope. Out of the doorway, a short distance away, really, but now seemingly out of reach, Barry poked out his head and looked at her. At least she would be able to say goodbye, she thought. That was until a split moment later, the insane human propelled himself at full speed out of the door and raced towards her. She wanted to scream at him that it was too late, that there was nothing that he could do, but could not bring herself to do it. It was a cowardly that she knew, but a tiny part of her wanted to be keep behaving like something was possible. These humans had defied many expectations, after all. Still, he could not fight all of them on his own. Perhaps he could buy some time for her to reach the room and exit out the back door, but they outnumbered him too much for that. As Barry got closer, she could hear him scream. Something seemed to fuel him. Hang on! He shouted, finally reaching her. She was surprised to see him stop and bend low in front of her, his arms extending towards her. Her shock grew as Barry lifted her off the ground and then turned back the other way, running or carrying her. It was not graceful like she had seen the inhuman stories, where a knight in shining armor carried off a princess. Barry simply not big enough to be able to wrap his arms around her in that way. Instead, he grabbed onto her legs and lifted from behind, leaning the center of mass against his back. Their speed increased above what her limp was, but still slower than what Barry's full sprint. As Barry entered the room and exited out the other side, Lucerna saw Laura and the other students' position close by. Once Barry crossed the other side of the back door, his grip on Lucerna faltered, and both went tumbling down. As if on cue, Laura began giving orders, Disconnect the lights, get ready to close the door when they've all crossed the first one, and then close the other door. The students obeyed, removing wires and cutting them from nearby electrical panels. As another one shouted from another position, able to see the Yushine enter the room, the doors were then closed on them, dragging the dozen or so pirates into a dark, empty room. Quickly, they began working to disconnect the power supply from the doors to prevent them from opening them from the inside. Laura oversaw the work, then added a few extra things. Make sure that you cut out the heat as well. I want them nice and cold out there, and we'll have the fires outside the doors. The doors would only last so long, however, so the others began installing secondary defensive measures. Lysana lay on the floor, her heart racing, and she breathed a sigh of relief. Feeling a small, steady pressure in her back, she remembered Barry and quickly rolled off of him. How did you do that? she asked him, perplexed. Panting, Barry lifted a finger to ask for some time to catch his breath. Probably a combination of things. The cocaine, the low gravity, the adrenaline. He managed to get out before stopping to focus on breathing again. Azumi came to the pair and helped them stand. No time for lying down. We still have stuff to do. Barry, I need you to go get John Francois's heating plate. We're going to need it. John Francois's ears rang as he got out of the steel suit back at the hangar. Thanking Smyriot for his help, he headed out of the dome and back to the ward's class. It had been a few hours now, and the pirates were nowhere to go. Now was the time to negotiate with everyone's release. To his surprise, when he reached the classroom, he found the two Yushine bodies laid on the floor and no one present. It seemed that they had fought back, but there was no telling what had happened afterwards. Wandering aimlessly, he finally came up on a large crowd of students sitting in front of a closed door with a small fire burning in front of the door. What's going on here? he asked the closest student. Oh, hey, we were wondering what happened to you. Figured you got captured by them before we managed to trap them in here. Now we're following Laura's plan and sieging them, answered the alien. Hearing Jean-Francois's voice, Izumi's head popped out from the crowd and she waved at him to come over. He approached and sat down next to her against the wall of the corridor, to the left side of the door. What's this about a siege? Well, it was safer than taking them head on. We figured that we can just starve them out. Started a fire in the door using the hot plate and there was one other door too. 
who kept them away from the doors. We need to keep this up for a few days until reinforcements arrive, and then we'll be done. You should go speak to Laura. She hatched up the plan. She's on the other side with Barry. Jean Francois stood up and headed along the way around the other door. Spotting Laura talking to a few students, he stopped in after the conversation was over. So, uh, you guys have been pretty busy too. Hey, you're okay. Um, you have no idea. A lot of it was assumptions, but we had to do something, anything. Now that they're in the dark, they can't regain energy, and we're using heat to keep them away from the doors, fire being a natural enemy to plants. They're patient ambushes by nature, so that's working against them too. What have you been up to? Um, I went through the dome and got a steel suit. Then with Smiriet, we disabled the pirate ship so they wouldn't have a way of the station. He tried to keep it short and to the point. No use mentioning how they dodged enemy fire and almost got blown up a few times. Laura gave him a thumbs up. Great, that takes care of one thing I was worried about, which was pirate reinforcements. Ah, there you are. I was beginning to worry about your disappearance, Mrs. Maldron said as she approached the pair. But are you certain that we can keep them confined for so long? We'll have to sleep at some point. We can take rotating shifts, and there's always someone watching, clarified Laura. Rotating shifts? One must sleep when they are tired. You cannot delay the inevitable, insisted Mrs. Muldron. You can't. Humans can stay awake for quite a long time if they want to. It does come with severe adverse health effects, but we could just go night shifts, and then the day the rest of you can cover us while we sleep, added Jean Francois. Laura nodded and smiled. All that's left to do is play the waiting game. A little more than three days is what it took for military forces to make it to the station. By then, the Yishine had been forced to undergo dormancy due to the lack of sunlight and nutrients, which was also helped by the room going colder than intended. The security teams, once they arrived, were able to safely and easily remove the pirates from the station. After a few days of rest and no classes, all students were called into the main auditorium. The headmaster looked across the entire room, his gaze passing over every student. All were arrayed side by side in the largest room of the station, the meeting by the academy having been called. I want to begin by offering thanks to those who stepped up and helped defend their fellow students against the Yoshine. Your actions were brave. We owe you a great deal of gratitude. We will contact your governments and ask them on how to proceed with regards to potential commendations. Taking a short pause, he resumed, Now the events of the last few days have shown us that perhaps we have been too complacent. This is a failure of both myself and the administration. That is why we will be fixing the damage that was incurred and redesigning the station's security, as the Academy will be unable to operate as intended during this time. We will be starting to work experience program earlier than expected. All of you will receive up to three options based on your scores and aptitudes of a profession to shadow someone in. Your teachers will now pass these on to you. Please exit the room once you have them. The deployments will begin over the course of the next week. Starting with those in front, the teachers began approaching students and talking to them while presenting their choices, offering guidance. Soon the room diminished and only the four humans remained, standing at the back. Their two teachers approached together and greeted them, with Mr. Florge taking first. This is a bit unusual, I must admit. When evaluating you, we had to consider the positions that you would be best suited for. This proved problematic, as we couldn't figure out where you performed poorly. Mrs. Moulton continued, Naturally, when we wanted recommendations based on what we observed, but at the end of the day, we do not think that there would be any bad choices for you to take. Turning towards Barry, Mr. Florge handed him three small plates of metal that were engraved. Barry, we would suggest something that enables you to make use of your physical strength, good reflexes, and bravery. We think that military career would work best for you, or perhaps something with the steel suit leagues. Mrs. Muldron approached Laura and handed her three small metal plates as well. Laura, we are your quick thinking and ability to create plans would make you a good asset for military command. Those same skills, however, could be used in other domains such as infrastructure planning. Mr. Florge proceeded on to Izumi. Your calm nature, even under stress, and the way that you are able to communicate would make you a good diplomat, I believe. 
You have no issue with absorbing new ideas and even learning how to work with alien technology. You could easily join the think tank or help integrate human technology with ours. Lastly, Mrs. Maldron went up to Jean-Francois. To us, you are perhaps the strangest of the four. You have ideas and concepts that are entirely foreign to us and know how to execute them. You've displayed skill at piloting a steel suit and are decently versed in a few subject matters. Yet, we do not know your true potential. You'd certainly be able to make it as a merchant or a founder of a company, but at the same time, we could see you spread your knowledge about human culture as a foreign ambassador. The two then stepped back with Mrs. Maldron wrapping it up. Your paths are yours to choose, as we believe you likely know better than us. If you wish to choose something different, we have left one of your plates empty, so it can be engraved with how you wish. Any questions? Why are you using metal plates? asked Barry, turning them over in his hands. Sometimes it is good to feel a physical reminder of one's accomplishments. We could easily have done it digitally, but for many, this is a trophy of sorts. Your plates are yours to keep, and past students have often kept them for their whole lives, Mr. Florge answered. Laura looked at the two teachers and asked, How long will this work experience last? Fourteen human months, give or take a month, by my rough approximation of your calendar, replied Mrs. Maltron. Their questions answered. The teachers then left, leaving the four humans to themselves. Well, I guess we're going to split up, huh? muttered Jean-Francois. Unless we all want the same place, yeah. But we'll come back here afterwards, right? added Barry. I'm looking forward to it. It's exciting, chimed in Laura. Well, I guess I'll go look at my options in my room. I'm sure they're listed somewhere on their net, said Izumi, as she began to walk out of the room. Hey, um, let's keep in touch, yeah, Jean-Francois mentioned, walking out of the room with the group. End of chapter. End of story. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Bezik, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Ashtraya the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.